The anime starts at a village which is flourishing with great natural resources and people who are adventurers and hardworking. This village is called the Labyrinth. It is fenced in such a way that it shows a labyrinth physically. In this city where all the boys sit gambling and doing all their other things is Nick, a young boy who thinks like an adult. According to his adopted father, he is a light fighter in an adventurer group called the Countless Battle Arts. He has just two aims in his life. The first one which is to get married and love the princess who he is dating. And his second dream is quite simple, which is to take the countless battle arts to the number one adventurer group in the whole village. Unfortunately, his dreams keep shattering one by one. The words of Argus, his adopted father who took care of him as a kid and recruited him into the group, echo in his ears. He remembers when Argus tells him that they no longer want him as a member of their group because, according to Argus, their interest no longer aligns with each other. Just as though that disappointment is not enough for our poor Nick, he remembers the word of his beautiful princess, who he is dating, when she tells him she no longer is interested in the relationship with him and she thinks they should break up. He remains at the table where she shares the news even after she leaves. He comments that the love of his life has also betrayed him and broken up with him. I can assume that you think that a great future awaits Nick. Uh, maybe you should take a pause. Nick is presently a total idol geek. He is at a concert screaming and shouting the name of his favorite idol, a gate, as she presents her song to her team. He keeps direct eye contact with her as she sings with her team and they present to their team. She asks her crowd which song she should present next, and they tell her she should present her blockbuster, which is the song The Saint Cheering Song. While in the crowd, he remembers how he felt after Argus sent him out of the team. He remembers that he was at the side of the pool, sitting there and thinking about his life. He wonders why Argus would do that to him, considering that Argus is his adopted father, who has taken care of him since he was a kid. He recalls that he approached Argus following an argument in the team. He asks Argus if he is meant to leave Garazo, who probably is another member of the group, and asks if Garazo should use the team's money to pay a woman. Argus tells him the conversation isn't about Garazo. He says the conversation is about him, and he thinks Nick is now much more mature than when he took Nick as a child and brought him home. He says Nick is already thinking like an adult and making decisions like an adult, and their insight no longer aligns, so Nick should do well to find a place that fits him, and he should leave their group. After that conversation, he leaves Nick inside the room. While Nick is lost in his thoughts under the rain and depressed, a young girl comes to him with an umbrella. She tells him he is getting wet by the rain, and asks if he needs help. He looks at her and bows his head back without giving her any attention. She gets angry that he behaves as if she is a stray dog, so she tries to command attention by going closer to him. She gives him a flyer telling him that she is an idol, although she is still a rookie idol, and one of her responsibilities as an idol is to share love and spread love among the people. So she can't leave him alone. She gives him a flyer inviting him to a concert the following day. She tells him the concert is at the public hall by the south gate the next day, and he should please come. He tells her he isn't interested, but she insists, and she leaves him there. The following day, he attends the concert and is so proud of the lead idol, the girl with blue hair, a gate. He takes some of their flyers as he returns to his house. At present, his home is filled with images of a gate and several pictures of her group. While lying on the bed, he decides it's time he goes to an adventurer meeting point to find a new group for himself. He goes there that evening in front of the house and he decides that it's time to find an adventurer party where he can work and earn money so he can satisfy his new urge for idols. He screams and enters with great positivity in his mind, but all his positivity gets discouraged when he gets inside. He sees an adventurer looking at the poster, and he tries to talk with him, but he remembers Argus's words, that he isn't cut fit to be an adventurer. When the man turns to talk to him, he pretends as if he is training. He decides that if he uses his skills as a former adventurer there, he will see someone who will ask him to join their party, but it seems as though all of his words are just wishes. He finds it difficult to ask to join any group as he doesn't want to trust anyone again after what happened to him with Argus. Eventually, he leaves the guild that evening with no party at all. He stands outside thinking about what he will do when he goes to an adventurer bar to drink. He overhears as members of several adventurer groups celebrate and drink together, 
but the drink in front of him seems too bitter for him to drink. He ponders his issues as he sits alone at his table until a lady who looks like a noble with her long hair and beautiful hair comes to join him. Also another man and an elf lady join them at the table. He sees as a man comes to speak with the noble lady, asking her if she will join him for an adventure. But she ignores him. He sees the gem on her hair and assumes that gem is an antique, and it would no doubt be really expensive. He looks at her dress and concludes that she could be a mage. He looks at the man beside her. He looks like a priest, and he is one. He sees that the man is drunk, and he instantly realizes that he could have drank earlier and didn't drink with the girls. He assumes he drank at a cabaret club as he smells of cosmetics. He assumes he's a healer without a party and finds out his tag as a priest is not on his neck. Then he concludes that he's an excommunicated priest. Then he looks at the elf girl. He sees she is a dragon kind. And looking at her fist, he could conclude that she is a veteran. However, she seems lost and without a party. After he finishes his unwarranted explanation, he decides to take a toast to Angus. He says fuck Angus and fuck being an adventurer as he's no longer interested in being an adventurer. He also says to hell with his girlfriend who has left him and he's no longer interested in love too. He decides to make a toast to all he has lost and he takes his drink. He drinks it and hits his cup on the table. Coincidentally, the other people drop their cups simultaneously saying they will never trust humans. The noble mage remembers her story. The girl, Tiana, is a noble from a wealthy family called the House of Elenefelt. She trains with herself as she calls out the lightning strike, and all her masters are proud of her as they see her works. She walks away after her training, and she says that being a magician isn't about magic. She claims that learning magic for her is not about magic, but learning humanity. She says learning magic is learning humanity. She enters a restaurant and asks for Alex, her fiancé. She meets Alex and she happily tells him about her latest win, hoping that he will be happy for her. But just as she says it, Alex tells the lady beside him that that's her personality. She asks him who the girl is and she says she is Line. From the house Delcott, Alex says Tiana likes behaving mighty and she marks all her wants for life. He says she makes it look like the teachers are liars and she keeps passing despite them knowing she isn't as good as she is. He says as a result of her good results instead of his parents praising him as they usually do, they compare him to her and he's no longer interested. He asks her who she sees in her eyes and walks out of the restaurant with Lene. As a result, Tiana packs her books and bows to get her father before leaving the city. She gets to the labyrinth hoping to find a job. She goes on a job search and she goes to three shops, but none of them wish to accept her. She walks away thinking of what to do with her life, then sees a flyer for a terrain dragon race ticket. She places a bet on a horse and her horse wins. We know what they say about gambling, it causes addiction. She gets addicted to gambling and gambles all of her money until she doesn't have any money to pay rent. She decides to become an adventurer, but anyone who attempts to request she join their party runs from her after seeing her face. After her story, the priest Father Zem tells his story. He is from a temple in the city of Medlar called the God of Revelation. The temple has a solution to every problem in life. And he has a little girl, Miral, who helps him get a leaf called Rami. After Miral brings the Rami to him, she will sit on his legs and he will give her a coin. One day she returns late from bringing the Rami, and he asks her why. He pays her the coin, but she holds his hands and tells him she is in love with him. He tells her she's just a baby and informs her that he is a priest and doesn't have the right to love anyone, so she should care for herself. She releases his hands and takes her coin, then decides to frame him for rape. The following day, as he administers drugs to his patients, he receives visitors and sees Meryl with them. He asks her what had happened, and the men say she was holding his coin all through. She tells him she trusted him and throws his coins at him. He is arrested and imprisoned for three months before he is banished from the city. He enters a restaurant where he sees that the attendant has hip issues. He heals her, and she gives him a gift the following day. She tells him he isn't a sinner and should go to the labyrinth to become an adventurer. The last girl also says someone she trusted took something from her. They all get drunk and the following day Nick wakes up in a room with them. 
He asks them to leave his house, but Tiana tells him she is the owner of the house, and they should leave. As the others leave, Nick calls out for them. He tells them that instead of returning to their usual addiction, they should stay together and form a party since they all find it difficult to trust humans. The narrator says their party will eventually be the one to save the world in a long time. So, let's watch out for the next episode to see the party. The episode starts off with Nick and his party, the Masters of War, intimidatingly asking the receptionist for work. The receptionist, seemingly shy, also gets scared. However, an old lady intrudes on the conversation and asks them not to scare their cute little receptionist. The old lady recognizes Nick as an experienced adventurer from the Countless Battle Arts Party. Our main protagonist, Nick, gets contended at the admiration, given by the old lady. The old lady muses and again admires Nick, but this time his whole party. She then honors the return of the survival lady. Nick, along with his party, is left confused by the statement uttered by the old lady. Well, Nick didn't know Curran, his partner, miraculously survived and returned alone from a C-rank labyrinth. Even Curran doesn't know how famous she is, but no one knows what lies behind her spectacular smile. Before assigning the work to Nick's party, the old lady asks for the part's name. Nick mumbles, survivors. His party looks at him perplexed while Nick reasons that we will certainly make it back alive. That's what survivors are, so we will be called survivors. His whole party sees eye to eye with Nick. The old lady again asks for the party's name. This time, Nick and his comrades speak one voice vigorously, survivors. Before the team sets out on their adventure, Nick instructs his team that as adventurers who don't trust anyone that leave their backs open, they should always follow three main rules. The survivor's three main laws. We don't interfere with each other's hobbies, says Tiana. Keep a good watch on our funds, Zim adds. And make it back alive no matter what. Curran concludes. The leader of the group, Nick, then assigns duties to each and every member of the group. Nick takes on accounting. Tiana makes sure it matches the actual money. Curran is held responsible for the safe and Zem is assigned to withhold the key. While Nick is carrying on his leadership speech, Zem cuts it and makes a point that Nick is assigning arduous duties to others and making a benefit for himself. Nick challenges Zem to give a backbone to his statement. Instead of Nick, Tiana replies that Nick has the least opportunity to touch the safe, according to the assigned roles. However, this internal dispute is handheld strikingly by the leader himself. He shares a backstory, a life-saving lesson he learned from what happened at the countless battle arts. Trust is something when you're not doubting each other. The party wants to have their trust in one another, but they can't give them their trust completely. In the broad daylight of the sun and in the gooey waterworks, Nick and his team start their venture. Easier said than done, Nick discusses the plan with his team about how they'll kill the monsters or floras, how they'll get the money from their cores, and how they'll distribute the money among the members. Just as the team enters a few steps into the labyrinth, they encounter their first target, a slime that appears to be rather cute and chewing on grass. The mission started rather easily. With no effort, Nick removes the core of the slime, dispatches it, and stores the core which is a source of money for the group. The party then carries on its mission, appearing to be joyful and talkative. Nick muses to himself about the high hopes he has for the team. As the party moved further into the labyrinth, they encounter more slimes and remove their cores. While dispatching off of a living creature doesn't seem right, if they are left undispatched, Maizma and Monster grow rapidly, making the labyrinth larger and larger and imposing threats to the people. It's an absolute rule of nature, survival of the fittest. It sounds cruel and pessimistic, but when there are no means of collaborating with the monsters, people have to kill them in order to survive. While proceeding, Tiana gets careless talking about her achievements of taking down goblins and other monsters. A bigger slime ejects a goofy projectile, as lethal as a banana peel, and she falls. Nick tells her that Bigger Slime can eject a goofy projectile, and that only if Tiana had been careful, it wouldn't have happened. Trying to accommodate her negligence, she unleashes her attack, Icicle Dance, but instead of shooting for the slime, she unconsciously unleashes it elsewhere, and Curran becomes the target of her attack. Fortunately, Curran blocked the attack with her sword, but her trust is broken. Curran is infuriated. She ignores Tiana's reasons and warns her that she might also make a mistake like this. Tiana is left shocked at her response. 
And from there, the team carries on its mission of the two of its members having a grudge against each other. In no time, the team reaches the top floor of the labyrinth, and here they find the biggest slime they've encountered so far, the boss of the gooey waterworks. Tiana, with her mood off, tries to show off, ignores the team, and goes for the big slime all on her own. In her own rage and stubbornness, she unleashes a big icy spear on the big slime, and with just one attack, it lives no more. However, with the deadly attack, the slime rips up and its goofy constituents are splashed on the whole team, leaving them filthy and goofy. The team exits from the labyrinth and takes a bath in the stream, flowing near the labyrinth. While Curran is still thinking of the incident that might cause her to lose her life, Nick explains why had the slime scattered its goo all over the place. Big slimes react to strong magic. That's the reason Nick gives to Tiana. Once refreshed, Nick gathers the whole team to regain the trust between Tiana and Curran. He tells all of his weak points to his friends, shows them all the pieces of equipment he has, and tells his team what they can do and can't. He says to his team that they're wary of each other because they don't have a clue about what they're capable of. And once you know all about them, you can give them your trust. At least that's how Nick thinks. Tiana questions him if he thinks each and every member of the team to open themselves and share their weak points. But Nick replies with a no. Nick just wants his team to stay united and trust each other till the very end. Stay loyal to each other as long as they are part of his team. Zem also shares his weak points with the team and tells them that he's almost very delicate to magic, fist, or any sort of combat and cannot manage to win one battle. But as a part of the team, he's really useful. The team cannot survive without a healer, especially one who also has put forward his devotion, loyalty, and trust in healing others. While Zem was carrying on his speech, Tiana goes to Curran, bends down in an apologetic manner, and tells her capabilities and weak points. She's a mage, best suited with water and wind magics, also good with their combination, lightning magic. But although she can use fire and earth magic, she's not that good at using them. She confesses her fault and apologizes to Curran. She is defenseless against earth and fire magic and quick range attacks. After saying all of this, Curran returns to the log when she was previously sitting on and sits down but appears to catch a cold. Curran uses her flame magic to make a fireplace in the middle of this wilderness just to help her friend warm up. And with this, the whole team gains its trust and is once again united as one. At noon, the team stands up and leaves for its next destination, the goblin forest densely populated with goblins that are pretty weak on their own. But as a pack, they can be tough to deal with. Just as Nick was saying this, Zem is attacked with a goblin. But Nick slashes the goblin and saves Zem. Attacking humans like monster feels even crueler than attacking living slimes. But what has to be done is to be done. All with no regrets and no guilt. Just after killing the first humanoid monster, the dead goblin's friends attack the team, but the survivors, united as one, fight back and easily kill all of them. Tiana uses her magic to search to get the location of the goblins and finds where the majority of the goblins are. Nick and the others don't know that Tiana can use such long-range searches, and they are all admiring Tiana for her practical magic. But this is where the challenge really starts. Tiana senses a monster, much stronger than the goblins themselves, within the pack. Zem asks if anyone knows what the creature could be. Whatever it is, it surely poses a serious threat to the team and is far more deadly than any monster they face today. Nick answers to Zem that it could probably be an ogre, an evolution of hobgoblin, and without a doubt, far stronger than any grunt. For someone as strong as Nick himself, it is a challenging fight. Even if they work together, the smallest miscalculation and mistakes could be the cause of their deaths. But what's even worse is that they do not currently have much experience working as a team, which makes the chances of mistakes even higher. Retreat is not an option here, because if they do, the goblins will group up with other packs and become even stronger. It would be more difficult to fight them than it is now. They would also impose threats on people living near the forest, but the most important reason is that it's a financial resource for the team. And since they're currently having a hard time, they cannot compromise on any coming money. The team then discusses its plan on taking down the ogre. Since it has high resistance against magic, the vanguard of the team, Tiana, is of no importance in the main fight. The only ones who can take the ogre down are Nick and Karin. 
Nick then assigns the roles to each member of the team for the fight. Tiana, as a long-range magic user, will distract the ogre. Zem will use his supportive magic to empower the team and heal them in case of any injuries, while Karen and Nick will slice down the ogre, disposing of it and taking its core. With their lives at stake, the team then enters into the fight, and there it was, the sturdy and dominant ogre, calling out for the fight. The fight begins. Zim empowers the attacker, Nick and Karen. Tiana takes down the goblins with her magic while Karen and Nick charge in for the big beast. No matter how many goblins they slice, they keep coming again and again. They aren't going to go down easily without a fair fight. Although the team didn't have their full trust in each other before, they have to be careful now not to leave an opening for anyone to come in, strike, and get the advantage of one another. In this fight, it was completely different. It was a live or die situation for them. And as survivors, they had chosen to survive according to the survivors' three main laws. In order to survive, they had to have their full trust in others. In order to fight and cut the ogre's sturdy skin, Karen has to charge in, leaving her back open and having trust in her team to protect her back. Karen keeps repeating, I have to trust them, sheathing her big heavy sword with powerful fire magic and slicing the ogre's sturdy skin in just one blow. That's how teamwork leads to victory. Without any one of the members, they certainly would not have won this battle. But today, they kept their trust in one another and successfully won. After they had won the battle, Nick goes to the corpses of the goblins and collects their cores. He also offers Tiana to collect them, but Tiana prefers to stay away from Nick's hobby of collecting the cores. While Nick was collecting the cores, Karen was thinking of her past. They didn't teach her anything back then because they said Karen doesn't have to learn anything. When Nick is isolating the ogre's core, he tries, but it didn't get separate. So he puts in more force, and with a jerk, he falls on Karin. While they hear the cracking sound of the ornament Karin had in her eyes, it was broken apart. What could be the meaning of this? Maybe Karin has escaped the dark past she once knew? And what awaits ahead is a bright future with people whom she gives her trust and calls friends. The Dragonkind kin is a very proud kin. However, they are tasked with a major duty, which is to follow every human who is to become the hero and they can save the world together. Curran, a girl from the dragonkind kin, is seen on the floor. She wonders if the life she is living is considered real, and she stands up to walk around the Labyrinth City. One thing about the Labyrinth City is that if you aren't smart, you will be outsmarted. Curran walks around mindlessly, reminding herself of the great works of the dragonkind kin. As she sees a man who sells a collection of beautiful pendants, pretty things are for the eyes, and Kuran isn't an exception. She falls in love with the collection, and she goes nearer to them to check it with no abstract intention of touching any of the pendants or holding one. As she arrives at the shop, the shop owner advises her to go nearer to the products and check them if she wants to do so. Following his advice, Kuran takes the pendant that she loves, and she admires it. Every eye wants beautiful things, so she asks for the price of the pendant. The shop owner tells her it's 20,000 dina. She certainly does not have that much, so she looks at the pendant disappointed, knowing that she can't buy it. She drops it reluctantly and turns to leave. If only she had known, she wouldn't have touched the pendant at all. As when she turns, the shop owner gasps angrily. He calls her back and tells her that since she knows she is from the dragon kind kin, with long nails, she shouldn't have touched the pendant at all. He shows her the pendant and shows her a scratch on it. He tells her she's the one who scratched it, and she has to pay for it. She tries to support herself, claiming she didn't do any damage to the pendant, but he keeps insisting that the pendant was okay when she took it and scratched it when she returned it. He asks her if she should report her to the authority, and says she looks like she has just arrived from the village, and they don't behave like that in the labyrinth. He tells her that since she wants the pendant, he will give her the scratched one for half of the real price, which is 10,000 dina. She stands there, not knowing what to do as the shop owner threatens her. Kalios arrives, and he reminds her of his earlier warning that she shouldn't leave the house for shopping without telling him. Then he goes to speak with the shop owner, who insists that it's Kuran who destroyed his pendant. He takes the pendant, telling Curran that she should scratch it again. The shop owner protests. He says she shouldn't scratch it if they don't want to pay, and the pendant is still his property. So Kalios brings out a coin of 10,000 dina. 
which he gives the shop owner for the pendant, and he tells Curran to scratch it. Although she is reluctant to do so, knowing that it will destroy the pendant, he forces her to do it. When she does, she shows the pendant to Kalios, and it is destroyed beyond repair. It's not just the tiny scratch that was on the pendant when the shop owner was shouting. Kalios asks her if there is a way she can inflict a smaller sign on the pendant, but she tells him her nails can scratch mildly. So he goes to the shop owner and brings out the original pendant where he had kept it behind his neck. Apparently after Curran turned, the shop owner took the pendant she touched and hid it, and brought out a scratched pendant to accuse her. Kalios tells Curran that it's a new trick used to trick people, and he threatens to report the seller to the authorities. He says he will only forgive him if he can give him the original pendant and the money he paid. He collects the pendant and asks Curran if she really wants the pendant. She replies affirmatively, so he gives it to her, and they continue their journey. While walking, Curran keeps repeating the phrase about the duty of the dragonkind kin. She says that her duty is to find the human who will become the hero so that they can save the world together. She says that she thinks Kalios will be the hero, and she just has to stay with him and save the world. She gathers more trust in Kalios because of what he did for her earlier, and she believes he really has her back. She returns to her room, and she thinks about her duty of saving the world. She prepares for her night's adventures, and she packs her load. She holds all her bags as Kalios comes to call her. He tells her they are leaving for their adventure, and she's about to leave with her bags. He tells her she doesn't need to carry the bag along, and there is no way anyone can steal anything in her bag. He advises her to trust them, and says they will all return that night, so there's no reason why she should carry her bag along. He hopes their adventure will be successful, and says they will soon be back. She's glad that she's going to fight again after the war. She remembers that it is the first time she is on a team, after the war has ended and she expresses her gratitude that she found a good team to join for her first attempt. She believes in all of his words. She stands up and follows him and his teammates for the adventures. And when they get there, they ask her to kill the first animal they encounter. She hits the animal and kills it on the first try. The other members of the group pack the animal, and they cut it off so they can carry it away. She asks to join them in the parking so she won't be useless but they laugh at her asking her why they would do that if she accepts to do all the work. Kalios advises her that as a team, a person does not have to do all of the work. They have to dedicate it, and a person should be in charge of what he or she does best. So she should concentrate on what she does best, and they will do the rest. She accepts his advice and tells him that she trusts him. They ask her to believe in them as a team, reassuring her that teams will never leave each other. They all leave that section of the labyrinth to enter deeply into the labyrinth to fight the pot snake. Before getting there, Kalios tells her the pot snake is a very sly and deadly snake who hides in a pot. He tells her that when the snake is in the pot, nobody can harm him, even with magic. And if they force him out of the pot, he will get angry and attack. So they have to dedicate that work to her. She will be the one to tease the snake out of the pot, and as a result, the snake will target her. They promise her that they will stay behind her and stop the snake from killing her, so she can defeat the snake. They ask her to trust them and to give her all as a member of the team. They eventually get to the pot snake. He's inside the pot, and when Kuran goes nearer, she hits the pot and the snake comes out. She dodges all its attacks and it tries to attack it, but she fails. The snake starts bringing out a green cover. It covers itself in a green cover and she doesn't know what it means. So she asks Kalios what the snake is doing. He tells her the snake is just trying to intimidate her, so she shouldn't accept. She keeps fighting, and the snake overpowers her. She feels weak and calls out for Kalios, but she can't find him, so she collapses. He comes out with his friends and they laugh at her. They reveal that the snake poisons the first person who comes nearer to him, but after the poison gets very weak, they kill the snake and leave her there despite her pleas that they should help her. She struggles out of the place alone and she remembers that she has to find her way back to the inn to get the dragonkind gem. She remembers that when the gem was given to her and the warning that the gem has to be with her every time and grow with her. She staggers to the inn and when she gets there the innkeeper remembers her as Kalios's colleague. They tell her Kalios has said that she died in the forest. She asks for her loads but they tell her Kalios has taken them away and he tells them he wants to return them to her relatives. She comes outside of the inn crying. She remembers when Kalios told her she should trust him. 
She attempts to remove her pendant and throw it away, but she couldn't. She holds it in her hands and bows it on the ground. She summons her strength the following day, and she goes around asking for Kalios. She asks everyone in the city if there is anyone that knows Kalios, but there is no one. She keeps walking until she eventually gets hungry. She looks at the money in her bag, and she wonders if it will be enough for her. She stands in front of the restaurant, and she thinks of what to do. She eventually sees a man who passes by her. She figures he is familiar. When she tries to think of where she knew him from, she overhears other people confirming her suspicion that he is Fifth, the solo diner who created a party alone. He is strong enough to enter the labyrinth alone, and he enjoys good food. She sees Fifth ordering a food, and she follows him. She orders the same food, and she enjoys it. She follows him into another restaurant and eats the same food as him. She keeps following him to every restaurant that he enters. She follows him around until they get to a restaurant. Inside the restaurant, a man passes beside Fifth and mistakenly knocks over his sword. Corinne uses her tail to hold it up for him, and he picks it up, saying it was very important to him. He appreciates her and attempts to leave, but she calls him back to appreciate him. He doesn't hear her. He instead says it's the good food of that restaurant that made him forget about his sword. As he leaves, Curran appreciates him in her mind, saying he has allowed her to forget all that is hurting her. She decides to continue eating good food, and food can only be bought with money, which is why she decided to find a job. Nick, upon hearing her story, feels bad for breaking her pendant. He goes to several markets trying to find that pendant, but he can't find it. While he keeps up with his search, he figures he might not find it. Aya comes to meet there. He tells her he is trying to find the pendant, but he can't, so she tells him to meet Curran and ask her where she bought the pendant so he can get it. He refuses to do so, saying he doesn't want to because he thinks she is still angry. She calls him an egoist and says it is his ego that is speaking. She says having an ego isn't a bad thing, but he should channel it into apologizing. He goes to meet Curran while she is buying a meal. She offers him the meal, and it is very hot. As he eats it, it burns him. She laughs at him cheerfully, and he figures she is usually calm. They leave to talk, and she tells him she's fine with what has happened. She says she's happy with the way they are, and she prefers it to how she had been living her life before. They all meet at the bar after their failed adventure, and the other adventurers laugh at them. After staying silent for a while, someone comes to call them. They meet a woman who tells them she wants them to hunt in the labyrinth of bonds. They assume it's all a joke as Nick does not understand. They ask her what she wants from them, and she says she wants the Holy Sword, the Sword of Bonds. The adventurers haven't made their decision, however, any decision they make will mark a change in their life regardless. Since the guild had just to hire them to find the Sword of Bonds, Nick starts negotiating with them very thoroughly. He sets it up so that they get paid per excursion, even if they don't find the sword. Moreover, he also asks for a map, a list of monsters in the area, a list of all the places that have already been searched, details on the sword, and a guaranteed minimum price regardless of the condition of the sword. After the contract was finished, they started exploring the labyrinth. They encounter stone-like monsters, but Curran easily kills them with her fire breath. According to the information given to them, the Sword of Bonds amplifies a party's power based on the bonds between them. Nick finds this ironic. But the others point out it's actually perfect for their group because they're trusting each other more and more. Nick laughs at their camaraderie, but he still feels guilty about Curran's pendant that he broke. While exploring the hallway, the group is slowly recognizing that the labyrinth seems a little weird. They have been walking along a corridor, built with everything at a regular spacing. As they walk ahead, the lights behind them shut down while the ones in front light up. Diana also points out that even the monsters are artificial. They are also careful to check for secret passages along the walls. Behind them, a security camera quietly zooms at them, and an old man's voice wonders if these new adventurers can make it all the way to his location. Following the guild's map, the survivors go down a flight of stairs to a floor labeled B12. Nick notices a side corridor with a dead end lit by a solitary lamp. Zem checks the map and confirms that there are indeed dead ends with lamps. However, Nick points out that the information they received says that the lamps were red. The one before them is colored green. Nick decides to check it out despite the other's hesitation. He reminds them that their mission is to explore, so they should be thorough in exploring. Furthermore, he also smells money. When Nick reaches the end of the corridor, the wall beside him suddenly pulls open and a secret passage reveals itself. 
The others were surprised since according to their information, that should have just been a normal wall. Meanwhile, another security camera is watching them, with the same earlier voice muttering that here is where their problems are going to start. The survivors enter the hidden passage and find themselves in a dark wide room, with numerous glass cases lined up inside. They wonder if they are supposed to find the sword in all these cases, but Nick notices a strange case in the distance faintly glowing red. Nick confidently walks toward it and tells the others it's probably there. Zem and Kuren follow him with Tiana, still feeling suspicious, so she stops them. She casts Detect Magic and surveys the surroundings. However, she finds no magic within a 1 km radius. She tells them that she's not sure if that means it's safe, or if somebody is blocking her search. Nick points out that they are just have to find who that somebody might be and report that to the guild too. He then continues walking toward the pedestal. When they near the case, the lights suddenly turn on and an old man's voice reverberates across the room. It congratulates them for overcoming great trials to reach that room and they are worthy of possessing his powers. The group traces the sound and figures it's coming from the sword hilt nestled in the case. Tiana wonders if it's the Sword of Bonds, but Nick doesn't think so. First of all, it's only the hilt of a sword, and there is no actual blade. Kuron wonders if it might be broken. Tiana suggests it might be a magic sword, and the wielder's magic forms the blade. The sword hilt is getting angry at the four adventurers ignoring him, but Nick tells him they don't have time to learn the names of broken swords, since they're busy looking for the Sword of Bonds. Finally, the Sword Hilt informs them that it is indeed the legendary Sword of Bonds that they seek, but the survivors don't believe him. They continue arguing whether it's broken or a magic sword. So the Sword Hilt continues to explain he is a proud sacred blade that only helps those who value justice and friendship. He is the angel class psychic weapon, the Sword of Bonds. Nick finally believes him and promises to not drop him before they can put him in the bag. This confuses the sword hilt and he asks why don't they just equip him. Nick explains he uses short swords while Kuren only uses her dragonbone sword. The sword hilt asks them what they plan to do with him then and the survivors simultaneously answer that they're just going to sell him. The sword hilt can only scream in sadness and frustration. He tells them that he doesn't want to be sold and he just ends up in some warehouse somewhere. He complains about how many years he had wasted after being deceived by the liars at the guild. A guild sealed him in a labyrinth, saying it would help him find someone worthy to wield him. However, he waited and waited in darkness for years, but nobody came. He then realized that they never intended to let anyone have him. Nick informs the Hilt that he's sympathetic to his story, but they all just got bills to pay. However, when Nick picks up the sword hilt, a hidden mechanism suddenly activates and a mysterious fluid flows from a hidden chamber. The sword apologizes to the survivors since the guardian system has been activated. They won't be able to leave the room without defeating the Amalagam Golem. The room suddenly shakes as someone breaks into the room. From the dust, the Amalagam Golem finally emerges. It's a golem made up of a metallic liquid with a huge glowing red eye on its face. The golem walks towards them and delivers a powerful punch at the survivors. Everyone jumps back from the attack and Tiana immediately casts a spell. Large icicles quickly shoot out from her staff and embed themselves in the liquid golem. The golem roars in pain and Curran dashes forward to attack. The sword hilt tries to warn her and Nick realizes something is wrong and shouts for her to get back. Unfortunately, he was too late. The golem shoots back the large icicles embedded in its body at Kuren. She manages to block one with her sword, but another hits her right in her stomach. This forces her to lower her guard and another icicle hits her in the head, knocking her back with tremendous force. Zem immediately runs to heal Kuren, while Nick puts the sword of bonds on his back and runs forward to distract the golem. If they're not careful, the survivors are going to die. He slashes at the golem's foot, but his short sword just passes through the liquid golem's limbs. He shouts for the others to retreat and head for the exit. The others run back while Nick continues dodging the golem's blow. Even though he can't damage it, he knows that if he keeps attacking, it will just focus on him and give time for everybody to get away. The sword of bonds in his back explains that the golem's body is composed of nanomachines. So ranged or sharp weapons won't touch it. 
The sword implores Nick to use him, and after they make it out of there, they can do what they want with him. It's his first and last request as a weapon. Nick draws him from his back, and a gold magical blade forms from the hilt. At the other side of the room, Curran, Zem, and Tiana are attacking the passageway that suddenly closed up. They notice a bright light coming from behind them, and when they look back, they see Nick wielding the Sword of Bonds. Meanwhile, the Sword of Bonds carefully looks at each one of the survivors, and upon observing Curran, tells Nick to envision Curran in her mind and shout Union. Nick is confused by the sword's orders, but he decides to do it. He shouts, Union, but nothing happens. He angrily shouts at the sword, but the sword itself is confused too. The golem attacks Nick again, and Nick counterattacks with the sword of bonds. This time, the limb he attacks gets cut off and falls to the ground. The sword, however, tells him his blade still can't kill the golem. The cut-off limb suddenly morphs into a tiny golem and attaches itself to Nick's foot. Nick gets distracted and the large golem swats him away, blasting him across the room and into the hole in the floor, from where the golem came from. The other survivors shout for Nick and they come up with a plan. Tiana casts another spell and freezes the golem. This time the golem stops in his tracks. She then tells Kurun to get Nick while the golem is incapacitated. Kurun jumps into the hole, leaving Tiana and Zem alone with the golem. The golem slowly breaks free of its icy prison by discarding the parts of itself that froze. Zem heals Tiana while Tiana casts Freezing again on the golem. They can't do anything more than buy time. At the hole in the ground, Nick finds himself underneath a ton of rubble. Curran comes to him and starts digging him out. Nick tries to tell her to run with the others, but Curran shouts back that they should go back together. Nick then apologizes for breaking Curran's pendant, since he knew it was important to her. Curran explains that her last party leader gave it to her, and she still couldn't believe they betrayed her and left her. She kept hoping that one day she'd wake up and find them there like always. Seeing the pendant made her believe in Kalios. She chose to spend her time with her memories instead of the people around her. So when the pendant broke, it wasn't a bad thing for her. Curran continues digging for Nick and when she finds him, offers him a hand. She pulls Nick out, and the two smile at each other. The sword tells Nick to say the word Union once again. Back in the room, the golem is almost on top of the two casters. Tiana smiles and tells Zem they did great, even without Nick and Curran. She then shouts at the golem, but the golem suddenly explodes in a bright light that also blinds Tiana and Zem. When Tiana and Zem open their eyes, they are shocked to see Nick but with Kordon's hair and dragon-like armor. The Sword of Bonds informs the nick Kordon hybrid that the golem has a core that moves at random throughout its liquid metal body. nick Kordon has bathed themselves in flames and attacks the golem that is attempting to reform. With a flash of their sword, the golem is wrapped in fire, destroying the body and pulverizing the core. nick Kordon then faints and they morph back to separate people. After their adventure, the survivors go back to the guild. There, Nick demonstrates the sword by summoning its aura blade. The others nervously hype up the sword while a kid with white hair and black keeps stating it's not that impressive. The guild agrees to pay them, but they also ask who the mysterious kid in black is. The girl introduces herself as Kijuna, a new member of the survivors. The guild owner gets curious since her name means bonds, the same as the sword. After the group leaves, they sigh happily since their plan worked. They found a stock of mass-produced copies of the sword which they can give to the guild. Meanwhile, Kijuna thanks her parallelization function that lets her have a human form. Nick scolds her for using her name when she introduces herself, but Tiana points out that sentient magic items have a lot of powers tied to their names. Like if they named her Mop, she might gain the power to clean up their rooms. Back at their inn, the survivors happily divide the money they earn. Kijuna asks them if they are going to the tavern with their money, but the group explains their number one rule to her, no interfering with other people's hobbies. Nick then leaves to go to an idol concert, while the others leave to do their own hobbies. Tiana invites Kijuna to go to the races with her, and Kijuna happily accepts. Outside, Kijuna's curious eyes can't help but look at the surroundings, from the trees to the bugs on the ground. Tiana pats Kajuna's head and praises her for waiting thousands of years in the dungeon. Kajuna gets annoyed since Tiana's treating her like a kid. However, she just jokingly calls her Mop and runs away with Kajuna chasing after her. With her newfound freedom, Kizuna is amazed at everything around her. 
from the unchanging course of the stars in the sky to the people arguing in the marketplace. She also notices the dust on the windowsills and even the weird taste of Nick over his teen idol posters. From the trash in the street and to the adventurers in the bars, Kizuna finds the whole wide world beautiful and she's not afraid to shout it in the middle of the streets. Meanwhile, the other survivors find this behavior weird. She also notices Tiana's igniter, complimenting its history and modifications. Tiana smiles at the praise of her beloved igniter. That was given to her by her master, and she compliments Kizuna back. Kizuna happily dances with the compliment and prompts the others to compliment her too. After all the shenanigans, Nick starts the party meeting of the survivors. For today's topic, he has decided to give out different tasks to the other members to keep their funds safe. He gives Kuran the lockbox containing their money, Zem the key to the lockbox, and Tiana a magic abacus. After giving out the task, Nick drops a few coins that they will put in the lockbox. Zem counts the coins equaling 230 Dina, and Tiana asks Nick what the coins are about. Nick then reveals that it is the overall wealth of the survivors, shocking the others at how low their remaining funds are. And so Nick announces that they should just go make more money by doing more jobs. In the past, before she became an adventurer, Tiana was a student at a prestigious school. However, due to unfortunate circumstances involving her fiancé and some nasty accusations, she was kicked out. Tiana is packing up her few books and other belongings when her master enters the classroom. Her master kindly reminds her that she might not be a student anymore, but she still and will always be a mage. He then hands her an igniter as a farewell gift. Tiana thanks her master, and in her mind laments that not only was she kicked out, but her master was also caught up in the scandal with her. She had ruined her career and dashed his hopes of ever attaining the title of sage. Her master then tells her that even though she's now free, freedom can be quite restrictive. Humans want to be free, but we also want somebody to need us. Humans are indeed strange creatures. Her master then tells her that it was just a joke and starts laughing uncontrollably. Tiana finds it weird that even though she ruined her master's life, he still gets to laugh and joke with her like nothing bad happened. Before she leaves the classroom, her master turns around and gives her one last lesson. According to him, she should always know who she is, what she's learned, and what she can do. That will be her treasure that no one else can take from her. After the cryptic advice, her master goes back to laughing hysterically and Tiana walks out of the school. However, Tiana opens her eyes and she's back to reality in her room at the inn working as an adventurer. She wonders whether she can just wake up one day and everything will be back to the way it was before. Before she was an adventurer, she would wake up in her bed in the mansion surrounded by pillows and fluffy blankets and wonder what things she'd talk about with her fiancé or what new magic she'll learn from her master. As each of the survivors wakes up, Kuran in her room with her sword, and Zem curled up alone in his bed, each of them has this lingering regret in their past and wonders if they can just go back. Meanwhile, in Nick's dream, he had just given his girlfriend Claudine her birthday gift. Unfortunately, she starts spouting that it's not enough and she wants more. She starts exclaiming that she wants to see everything that has changed since she was sealed away. Nick then wakes up from his nightmare and finds out that Kizuna was sending his sleep talk directly into his brain. That would explain Claudine's rant in his dream. Now that he's awake, Nick wonders if he too can just wake up in the past before everything went wrong in his life. The group then reconvenes at their usual place for their daily meeting. Unlike all the other members wanting to go back to the past, Kizuna just happily exclaims that she has no past she wants to return to. Her time today with the others is the most fun she's ever had. The others are blinded by her optimism and innocent attitude, and they all wish they could just be like her. For their job today, they head to an ice labyrinth, and their target is a Rasetsu ogre. The group uses Kizuna's skill, telepathy, so they can talk to each other without alerting anyone else. Utilizing this handy skill, they were able to sneak up near their target and watch him, so they could plan their course of attack. Zem idly wonders if they beat the ogre before, but Nick points out that it's not the same one. Tiana explains that ogres are reborn each time that Miasma gets thick. Gurren, meanwhile, is just appreciating the fact that they can chat with everyone telepathically. 
Kazuna scolds her and tells her that her telepathy is not for chatting and having fun, so they should just use it for serious stuff. The others start appreciating their telepathy when Kuren suddenly speaks, not from their hiding spot, but all the way from the ogre's side, happily and mindlessly testing the range of their telepathy. Tiana berates her for being too far ahead, but Kizuna takes this chance to dash forward immediately. She tells the others that her true power isn't telepathy, but in her blade. The Rasetsu ogre finally notices them and turns around. Nick exasperatedly asks what the point of telepathy is if they are just going to wing their attack at the end. The ogre swings its club of ice at Kizuna, but Kizuna deftly blocks him with a sword. The ogre jumps back and fires an icicle at her, but Kizuna deflects the projectile. She then quickly teleports to the ogre's face and attacks. When the ogre blocks her attack, she activates her skill Parallel, creating multiple copies of herself. The other survivors' members are surprised by her skills as she battles with the ogre all on her own. Meanwhile, Kizuna can still hear all their reactions since the telepathy skill is still active. Kizuna and her clones then surround the ogre and attack from its blind spot, bringing it down and defeating it. The others walk up to Kizuna and Nick mentions that he feels tired for some reason. Kizuna reveals that she's using Nick's stamina and magic to activate her skills, so that's probably why. Nick feels that he should be more concerned with the revelation, but he's just too amazed at Kizuna's skill. Not only at magic, but also with the sword. Kizuna explains to the others that her sword skills were installed on her when she was still in the developmental stage during her creation. She had absorbed the techniques of a swordsman who used her in the past. Not only that, she still has her most powerful technique, Union. However, Nick confesses that he's not planning on using Union at all, since it makes them collapse into exhaustion afterwards. Nevertheless, the group expresses their gratitude to Kizuna since they have someone they can rely on. They then start talking about what they should do after the job, irritating Kizuna again for using her telepathy for chit-chat. Back in the city, Kizuna tags along with Kuren and Nick to go for a meal. To Nick's surprise, the restaurant Kuren chooses is the same one that Nick had in his dream. The three enter and order their food. Kuren starts extolling how fish should be cooked, and Nick jokingly points out that she does go through their food budget. But Kuren just reminds her of their first rule, not to interfere with each other's hobbies, earning her some apologies from Nick. While eating, Nick's dream seems to be coming true since he suddenly hears Claudine. And there she is, sitting in a booth inside the restaurant, being given a birthday gift. Instead of him, however, it was a random kid giving the gift to her. Nick can't help but overhear their conversation. Claudine starts crying and tells the kid that she has to go, unfortunately. Back to her hometown since her mother is sick. Moreover, she needs to find the money for the one-month carriage ride. The gullible kid takes pity on the crying Claudine and offers her the money she needs. Before anything can happen further, Nick interrupts them and joins them in their booth. He then tells Claudine he didn't know they already moved. She told him before that her mother only lives three days away, but now it's one month away. He also asks her how she has two birthdays in one year. Nick just keeps revealing Claudine's lies one by one to the kid. Claudine gets defensive and takes the birthday gift. However, Nick tells her that if she sells the gift, that would be an automatic fraud charge. Claudine tries to leave and take the boy with her, but Nick just reminds her that if she continues, she'll get a bounty on her head. Claudine gets angry at Nick for giving away her scam and throws the gift at Nick before angrily walking out. Nick returns the gift to the kid who is sad that he was just being played along for a con. Kuran then calls Nick to continue their meal. Later, the survivors are having another team meeting to discuss what quest they should take up next. Most gathering quests involve plants that only bloom in the labyrinths. While ores and jewels can be found in cave labyrinths, Nick's discussion gets interrupted when beer is suddenly poured over his head. Claudine has come back and she's not alone. A muscular beast man accompanies her. He is another member of Claudine's party, the Iron Tigers. The Beastman introduces himself as Leon and intimidates Nick for ruining Claudine's scam earlier. However, Nick was unfazed and just mentions that Claudine was planning to run away from the Iron Tigers with the money. He's trying to sow discord between Leon and Claudine. Claudine snaps back that he's just bitter because she dumped him. Leon tells Nick that they should take it outside and walk away. 
Nick consoles his teammates that he won't need help and follows Leon. In an alley outside, Nick immediately goes into a fighting position. However, Leon suddenly bows his head and apologizes to Nick. Leon then tells him that he knew what Claudine did to him before and Claudine underestimated him. He also thanks Nick for calling out Claudine's scam. Leon then offers Claudine to him, since Claudine conned a lot of people and made lots of enemies. She was able to make a lot of money for the Iron Tigers, but it might be time for her to leave the group. Leon also pointed out that Nick himself was at a party with a noble girl, a dragon lady, and a naive priest, so he was probably running his own scam himself. The thought of robbing Koran or Tiana makes Nick laugh. Then he delivers a surprise uppercut straight to Leon's jaw, knocking him over. Leon gets up and pulls out his sword, but Nick easily disarms him and pins him to the ground. Nick then tells Leon that he does want money. But would scamming people really be worth it, even if he made a fortune by taking advantage of other people? Would the ale he buys taste good? Nick is then blasted away by another one of the Iron Tigers, a sorcerer kid. The sorcerer is then knocked over by Curran, who suddenly shows up with her tail wrapped around the sorcerer's foot. Nick walks toward them and thanks them for their help. Leon readies himself to attack again, but the guildmaster finally shows up and scolds them all for causing a commotion. The guildmaster then tells them that if they follow the correct rules, she has no intention of stopping them. This confuses Nick, but Leon just accepts her condition and suddenly challenges Nick to a mathematics bare-knuckle battle. Now, not only Nick is confused, but the other survivors are too. The guildmaster explains the mechanics of the mathematics bare knuckles battle. It is a one-on-one -on -one bout of mathematics and brawling held at the same time. There will be 10 rounds in total, with each round ending after one side solves the math problems. Each problem set will be tougher than the last, and for each 10 point difference in score, the brawler will get one free hit at the enemy. To determine who will be the mathematics player, they will pick a name out of the box. Unfortunately for the survivors, the drawn name is Curran, their muscle-brained Dragonian fighter. Curran stutters in disbelief and nervousness, but Nick just cheers her on. Claudine was picked as the mathematics player for the Iron Tigers. To prepare for the event, Curran first takes a mock exam and Zem checks it. After checking, Zem happily announces that Curran has potential. Kuran immediately asks what score she got, but Zem just appreciates her hard work. Kuran keeps happily asking what her score is, but Zem just happily smiles and compliments her. Nick finally intervenes and tells the two to stop it, so Zem shows Kuran the checked mock exam. She looks at her exam papers and sees that she got 18 out of 100. Kuran cries out that she can't do it, but Zem calmly explains to her that at least they know what she can and can't do and how to help her. While walking back to their base, Kizuna points out that they should just let him help, especially when he has telepathy. However, Zem points out that he's too strong, and they want his help as a party member, not just from his powers as a sacred blade. Kizuna happily accepts the compliment and promises to help. The survivors then spend the whole week training and coming up with plans. While studying her mathematics, Kuran points out that lately Zem seems to be hanging out with girls in brothels all day. At the brothel, Zem happily enjoys his time with the women, but a girl tells Zem that he should stop wasting everybody's time and get to the point. Zem smiles and begins questioning the different girls. From them, he learns that Claudine breaks a lot of men's hearts. Beg seems to be very creepy, and Leon is not just strong, but pretty smart too. One girl also mentions that the new girl, Rose, was talking about some strange man. This immediately piques Zem's curiosity, as he sets a meeting with her. Rose describes the strange man as a male with wavy flaxen hair, beautiful soft blue eyes, long light pink fingers, a sexy voice like velvet, and wears a cassock that stands out in places like brothels. Rose was actually joking since the strange man he described was Zem himself. Zem then returns to the other survivors and reports his findings. The group concludes that the Iron Tigers will try some kind of trick in tomorrow's battle. It is obvious they have done it before, based on the way they behaved and the way they confidently lured them into the event. Thankfully, Rose also gave Zem more valuable information about the Iron Tigers. Zem reports to Nick that the Iron Tigers share information so they can outsmart the enemy. Tiana hypothesizes that they are probably using thought gems to communicate. 
The gems work like telepathy, but are not as powerful. Kuron asks what she should do, but Nick tells her that she should just use everything she learned and studied in the past week to solve the math problems. Elsewhere, Claudine is dreaming about her past. She was a happy little girl with her parents working at a carriage station. However, when they started embezzling small amounts of money, her parents got caught and fired. Her parents planned to sell her off, so she ran away. Now, alone, she had to find a way to survive. Fortunately, she was pretty enough, which helped her do fraud. Moreover, she also has the smarts to do different kinds of cons and scams. She met some decent guys and earned enough to live by, and that's when she met Nick. Claudine believed that the more people she could steal from, the happier she'll be. However, Nick proved her wrong. Claudine wakes up from her nightmare and angrily vows that she'll have her revenge. On the day of the Mathematics Bare Knuckle event, the two groups, Survivors and Iron Tigers, convene on the rooftop of the guild amid the cheers of onlookers. Round one starts, and Kuran and Claudine receive the first set of math problems. It was a simple addition and subtraction. Kuran smiles since it's the type of problem she has studied. But Claudine chimes in and tells her that these are problems a kid could do. Kuran tells her to shut up, and she decides to finish the problem quickly to help Nick. In the boxing ring, Nick and Leon are face to face ready to fight, with a crowd of onlookers cheering them on. Nick uses his superior agility to send a punch, but Leon just deftly steps aside. Nick steps back, leaving himself open to an attack, but Leon doesn't take the bait. Nick tries to attack again, but Leon keeps dodging, not even counterattacking. He finally realizes that Leon is just buying time. Meanwhile, Leon notices from Nick's expression that he understands a part of their plan, but he is confident that the whole thing is foolproof. After a while, Kuran raises her hand and declares that she has finished the problems, signaling the end of round one. Claudine is surprised that she finished first, and they all take a break while their exam papers are checked. Unfortunately, when the scores were announced, Kuran got 86 points while Claudine got 98 points. Seeing the scores, Zem identifies that the problem with going fast is that you might get in such a rush that you get sloppy, causing you to lose points in the end. Just like what happened to Kuran, Claudine smiles and tells Kuran that she's better than she thought. Meanwhile, Kuran yells an apology to Nick, but Nick just assures her it's fine. Nick braces himself and Leon delivers a powerful punch right at Nick's gut, causing Kuran to gasp in terror. Nick knows that in a battle where brawling and math are done at the same time, people might think that math is there to preserve your stamina. You can save the brawler's strength by finishing the math problems quickly like Kuran did, but math can be used as an offensive tool too, just like what the Iron Tigers are doing. Round 2 starts and Nick charges in to fight. Nick finally realizes that the brawlers are not important in the fight, and that is why Leon just keeps retreating to buy time. After round two, the scores are once again shown. This time, Claudine scores 98 and Kuran scores 79. Claudine points out that she almost earned two penalty strikes for their team, causing Kuran to be horrified. Leon delivers a heavy punch at Nick's face, making Kuran flinch and look away. Nick, however, calls to her and with a bloodied face tells her to stop looking afraid. After all, she's not the one getting hit. Nick tells her that last week he actually prepared himself to get hit dozens of times, but thanks to Kuran, he only got hit twice. He also points out that Kuran started by getting 80% of the questions wrong, scoring only 18 on her first mock exam. But now, she's scoring 80% right and is a full-fledged mathematics bare-knuckle player. Nick then calls her amazing, lifting Kuran's spirits who beams happily at the compliment. Claudine asks why she's so happy when it's just simple arithmetic, but Kuran explains that she's happy since she can now do something she couldn't do before. At the start of round three, Kuran happily goes back to answering her math problems. Claudine tries taunting her and calling her a Dragonian bumpkin, but her sneer becomes a frown when Kuran just ignores her. Kuran was actually glad that she was able to solve the math problems she couldn't understand in the past. However, she couldn't let herself feel it because Nick was getting hurt. But now that Nick told her she was happy with her progress, she can answer the questions happily without hesitation. From the audience, the other survivors are watching the battle carefully. Most people would cheat after the start so they can quickly finish the fight before something unexpected happens. However, the Iron Tigers didn't do it at the beginning. 
This is because they would lose time repeating the questions and answers telepathically to each other. That is why they are trying to buy time and let the problems get harder. When Quran stops being able to blaze through the questions, that is when they will use the thought gems to give Claudine a boost. At the ring, Nick is getting tired and he realizes if he still wants to use his speed to go on the offensive, he has to do it now. Meanwhile, Leon is ignoring the shouts of the crowd calling him a coward for always just retreating and dodging. Tiana uses her magic to detect any telepathy and other forms of magic around the area, but she doesn't see any traces of magic use. She worriedly wonders if the enemy has something else planned. To nudge the enemy to cheat, Tiana abruptly raises her hand and calls the guild master. She suggests that they just give the players all the math problems and give the penalties all at once. The crowd immediately likes her idea, and Nick also voiced his support. Meanwhile, Leon wonders what they're planning since Nick would probably die if he punched him a lot without him defending himself. The guildmaster accepts Tiana's suggestions and hands out all the math problems. Claudine wants to make sure that they win, but she gets shocked when she sees Kuron quickly answering the problems. She finally contacts Beg, their other teammate, who is waiting somewhere else with a calculator and paper. She starts sending the questions to him, and Beg sends the answers back. Tiana uses her magic again to detect any other magic and finally sees something in the distance. She and the others quietly leave to confront him. Nick notices their departure and smiles. He asks Leon where their other party member is, but Leon just anxiously answers that he was busy doing something else. Leon then notices that Nick's party members are gone, especially the girl who proposed changing the rules. He feels that something seems wrong and finally realizes that it must be a trap. He shouts at Claudine to stop what she's doing, but Claudine just snaps back since she's trying to focus. The guildmaster then scolds them for talking during the match. Claudine is still trying to continue sending and receiving answers telepathically from Beg. She angrily looks at Nick and wonders how he was able to bounce back from her betraying him. Elsewhere, Beg is finding it difficult to solve and keep track of all of Claudine's questions. Thankfully, Kizuna was there to help him. Beg thanks Kizuna, then reels in shock to discover that he's no longer alone. In the ring, Nick and Leon continue trading punches. Nick smiles when he sees the others return and tells Leon that they were foolish to challenge them. Meanwhile, Claudine is getting irritated since Beg is not answering her anymore, and angrily shouts out loud that he's taking too long. Everyone is surprised to hear her shout. At that moment, Tiana enters with Beg in tow. Tiana shows them the thought gem Beg was using, and the guildmaster asks if Claudine has one too. Claudine grits her teeth since their cheating was discovered, and the guildmaster officially ends the battle. Guards restrain the Iron Tiger members and lead them away. Leon asks when they figured it out, but Kuran just tells him they knew they were bad people right from the start. Claudine abruptly speaks up and exclaims that she wasn't a bad person at the start. She cries and struggles, shouting that she tried to believe. Kuran calmly accepts her answer and tells her that maybe they just went off the right path somewhere. Tiana then tells them that they can still go back and fix their wrongdoings. They cannot start over, but they can correct their mistakes. That night, the survivors are enjoying dinner at the restaurant. Kuran speaks up and asks Nick if they were just going to catch the Iron Tigers cheating. Did she really need to study? Nick, however, told her that her answers were still crucial to the plan. Tiana also points out that the math can also help in her daily life. For example, she can now easily tell the best deals on food. The group laughs together, but outside, a foot heavily runs on the rooftop. In the past, Leon was in an adventure party named Silver Tiger Cores. Their leader, Bichot, is even smarter than the average tiger kind. And also Leon's older brother. One night, their adventure party tried to tackle the merciless labyrinth, Metal Moon Goal. One by one, the members of their party are picked off by different kinds of traps. However, their party didn't give up. They entered the labyrinth to take every treasure inside. This would have been impossible without their brother's intellect. His brother has attained fame and fortune in large amounts. Unfortunately, this also attracted his death. He died a pitiful death in his home at the hands of humans. From that day on, Leon never trusted humans ever again. In the present, Leon is now in the hands of the guards after being caught cheating on the mathematics bare knuckle battle. A guard enters, draws his sword, and slowly stabs him in the chest. The guard asks Leon where the treasure his people took. 
The treasure never showed up in the black market, so Leon must have it. In truth, Leon is indeed keeping one special secret. It is the treasure that he took from the labyrinth that night. It was a treasure that is too dangerous to use or even sell. Leon calls upon the treasure sword of ruin, and it instantly breaks into the room and floats in front of Leon. Elsewhere, Tiana is carefully scrutinizing the players around the table. There is the blue-haired woman providing money to her boyfriend. This is the blonde-haired boyfriend, who Tiana will call the leech. This is the dealer expertly shuffling the cards who is planning to swindle the leech. And lastly, another guy just taking the opportunity to make some small change. Tiano narrows her eyes and silently declares that she will crush them all without hesitation. They are currently playing poker inside a casino. Various games like slot machines and roulettes can be heard all around, with chips changing hands ever so often. Nick is just absentmindedly looking around while Kizuna is happily waiting at the back of a line. After finishing the arithmetic bare-knuckle match, the survivors have made a bit of money and are currently on break. One day while browsing magazines, Kizuna discovered that the ice cream served at the casino is quite good. Thus, he and Nick asks Tiana to bring them there. Unfortunately for Kizuna, a casino employee abruptly informs him that the ice cream is sold out. Kizuna tries to explain that he had been waiting for so long in line, but the girl just answers him with passive-aggressive politeness. Kizuna walks away and Nick suggests that they can play some games in the casino. But Kizuna informs him that he has a limiter set on his ethical code that makes him unable to gamble. Kizuna looks at gambler's cards and is amazed to find out that they use anti-magic paint. A dealer happily explains to them that everything used in their game is processed so they repel magic. Outside the casino, Leon had just arrived. However, he is now transformed into a larger, more aggressive version of himself. Meanwhile, a stack of chips has accumulated in front of Tiana in the course of her game. The other guys around the table are looking annoyed while the dealer flashes a smile to Tiana. She and the dealer silently communicate that they will swindle the leech together. When the cards are shown, Tiana has the best hand, which means she means all the chips once again. The leech protests that Tiana must be cheating, but Tiana just feigns innocence while the others look away. Tiana continues to taunt him that he does not have what it takes to gamble, and he doesn't even use his own money anyway. The leech angrily stands from the table and walks away, leaving his girl behind. The girl asks Tiana if she was trying to make the guy stop gambling, but Tiana explains that she was just taking advantage of an easy mark. The girl smiles and thanks Tiana, and Tiana advises her to just leave the guy. As a gambler, one must know when to abandon something. The girl asks if Tiana thinks she has what it takes to be a gambler, but Tiana points out she's already a gambler, the kind that will never give up on her dark horse and wins in the end. Out of nowhere, a commotion outside suddenly captures their attention. Crowds of people are running away from something. Tiana calmly stays put and watches as a large tiger-like creature enters the casino. Meanwhile, Leon is looking at each person inside the casino. He's getting confused as to where he is. Since he only just wants to find Nick, a group of guards confronts him with sticks, but he easily swats them away. In his mind, he remembers when he and Nick met that one time. He recognized that, unlike him, Nick never fell into despair. He hated it and was jealous of him for it. Back in prison after summoning the Sword of Ruin, the sword cuts his bindings off and asks him if he is finally willing to use it. Leon tells the sword that he just wants to kill someone. In response, the sword promises to evolve his senses so he can hunt his target. Leon then grabs the sword and shouts, Evolution! With that, he easily defeated the guards and broke out of the prison. This brings us to the casino where Leon is now tracking Nick's smell in his evolved form. Tiana and the girl are discreetly watching him while the others are trying to escape the casino. Tiana laments that she left her equipment at the deposit when entering, so she can't find the monster. Unfortunately for her, Leon finally finds her and recognizes her as Nick's party member. He asks Tiana where Nick is, but Tiana doesn't recognize Leon. When Leon finally introduces himself, Tiana is shocked at the change in his appearance. He then asks her again about Nick's location and warns her that with this evolved form, he can smell if she's lying. Deeper inside the casino, Nick and Kizuna finally hear the commotion and are confused to see the throngs of people running past them. Meanwhile, Leon is now threatening to crush Tiana with his paws if she doesn't answer truthfully. 
She asks him why he's taking her hostage, and Leon replies that Nick will, of course, rescue his friends. This makes Tiana laugh, and she tells Leon that they aren't actually friends. Her actions confuse Leon, so Tiana takes this opportunity to lighten up her pipe using her igniter. She explains to Leon that it's a very special igniter given to her by her professor. She then stabs the igniter at Leon and electrocutes him with it. While Leon is down, Tiana and the girl quickly run past him to escape. Their escape is cut short, however, when Leon throws a table right in front of them. Tiana falls to the ground while the girl is knocked unconscious by the table. Tiana is shocked to see Leon without a burn on his body and slowly walking towards her. She shouts at the leech cowering behind a table to go rescue his girl. And in a rare show of courage, the guy actually does. Tiana tells Leon that their party members aren't actually friends, but just a group of fragile people supporting each other. They just help each other until they can gain a profit and enjoy their individual lives. Leon sniffs the air and gets confused since Tiana doesn't smell like lies. However, he still wants to test her and attacks her with his sword. To Tiana's surprise, Nick is there to block the sword. Lightning crackles between the two at their sores meet. Nick then looks back and tells Tiana that she can't die since he would feel indebted to her if she did. Leon is about to continue the fight when his sword speaks again and warns him that someone else was there. Nick's sword, the Sword of Bonds, answers them and greets them. It turns out that the Sword of Bonds and the Sword of Ruin know each other. Nick finally notices that Leon is also talking to his own sword, but the Sword of Bonds warns him that the Sword of Ruin seems to be the one in control. The Sword of Ruin greets the Sword of Bonds since it has been several centuries since they have met last. It asks them to step aside, but Nick and his sword reject the request. The Sword of Ruin decides to give its full power to Leon, further increasing his size and strength. The Sword of Bonds tries to talk sense into the enemy's sword, since Leon clearly can't handle the power and his mind would get consumed along with his body. The enemy ignores their pleas as Leon suddenly attacks Nick again. Nick dodges the attack and Tiana shouts out that they might need to use Union to defeat Leon. Since it's their only choice, Nick and Tiana combine, transforming themselves into a long-haired individual wielding the Sword of Bonds. They cast Ice Age, freezing the surroundings and imprisoning Leon with ice shields. Leon easily breaks their ice and charges at Nick-Tiana hybrid. They dodge him, but he just continues going on a rampage. In his mind, Leon doesn't know anymore what he's doing. He won't make any money from going on a rampage, and no one gets happy from it. It's not what he wants to do, but he can't seem to stop destroying everything around him. All he wants is a little payback, but now people are flying from his swipes, guards, women, and children. There are no exceptions. Even the pricey-looking ornaments which he would have stolen before are now just laid to waste by his very own hands. The Sword of Ruin answers him, telling him that it's fun having overwhelming power. What's more, everyone is left speechless by their power. They run, hide, and accept their death might come at any second. Leon releases a blood-curdling growl, but on the inside, he's wishing for everything to just stop. While he's distracted, Nick Tiana attacks and once again imprisons Leon in a block of ice. Inside his mind, Leon is confronting the Sword of Ruin. The sword tells him that from the day he took him from the labyrinth, he was already a rampaging beast. That's why he managed to obtain the sword in the first place. Leon denies the sword allegation and insists that he was just going on an adventure with his brother whom he admired. However, the sword reminds him that his brother still died. Meanwhile, Nick Tiana Hybrid casts Ice Spear, stabbing Leon with icicles throughout his body. Leon cries out in pain, but inside he's still talking to the sword, telling him that his brother died because the people they thought were their friends killed him. Even though they took care of them, they still killed him. However, the sword points out that it is exactly why Leon hates humanity and why the sword shows him. That is also why Leon started deceiving people and scamming them. Leon tells the sword that he's not a bad person. He was once just a kid enjoying life with his brother. He wishes someone would save him to stop his rampaging body. And as an answer to his wish, the ice around him crackled and Nick Tiana was there. They shower him with cards and Leon slowly topples over and drops the sword. Nick Tiana immediately freezes the sword while Leon is reverted back to his original form. It turns out the anti-magic coating in the cards repelled the Sword of Ruin's magic. By sealing up the magic causing the evolution, the blessing to the sword's wielder is cut off. Nick Tiana then takes the sword, leaving Leon lying on the ground surrounded by guards. Later, Leon is back in jail. 
Now, with chains preventing him from escaping, Nick then visits him and observes how Leon's body has grown worse after his evolution. Leon had grown thin with his muscles now gone. He then informs Leon that even though the casino was wrecked, no one got hurt. Moreover, they have sealed the sword. Leon realizes that Nick was the long-haired blonde individual he fought and laughs in satisfaction that Nick is still the one who defeated him. As Nick walks away, Leon confesses that he never got drunk on the money made from deceiving people. Nick tries to take his usual run around the garden. He keeps running, and at a point, he assumes that if he continues at that pace that he is going, he will get to where he wishes to reach as fast as possible. Suddenly, he hears a gay's voice telling him he should keep running and working hard. He stops for a while and looks around him trying to confirm if he is really hearing a Gates voice or if he's hallucinating. He wonders if he is indeed too stressed that he is seeing things that aren't real, and he asks if that's really a Gate. A Gate who is actually behind him but has decided to be petty, tells him she is the one. He assumes that he must have been thinking about her for her to appear and speak to him, but regardless, he's fine with it. She tells him that she has devised a means where she stays in the heart of her core fan. And because he's really her core fan, he is in his heart. And he is speaking to him from there. He's glad about this, and it pleases his soul. She tells him that all he has to do is to keep buying all of her music so she can remain in his heart. And he says that the agate in his heart is a lot more greedy than he had thought. She advises him that he is running too much and should take a break. He decides to follow her advice, and he turns back to rest. He sees her at his back and screams. They both stop by a park where they sit and drink water. She tells him he was running around the garden tirelessly and says she is sure he has a goal. She calls him Mr. Stray Dog since that's the name she has given him since the first time they met. He tells her he has a goal, and she comments on how glad she is that he isn't goalless. She tells him that he is no more a headless stray dog. That she met by the way that day and she's glad that he now has things he is doing for himself at that point it seems like she has lost him in the conversation as he doesn't understand what she means by her statement he tells her he doesn't understand her and she sometimes talks in a way that he doesn't understand so she decides to gather her thoughts together before talking she tells him that the day she met him and gave him the flyer to her event there were two thoughts in her heart waging wars with each other. The first thought in her heart was that she was glad that she had given him the ticket, while the second part of it criticized her for doing so. Regardless, he attends the concert, and when she sees him by the crowd, again, two thoughts wage war in her heart. The first one is glad she invited him, while the second one regrets it again. The reason is that, while as an idol, it's very important that there are people who love you and want to be your fan, there will also be people who take it to the extreme and become obsessed. She continues and watches him become a real idol otaku, and she tells him she is glad he didn't make a wrong decision, trying to talk about her beliefs. He tells her that if she hadn't given him that ticket that day, which lured him to the concert and made him become an otaku, he would have become something else, maybe a criminal. So she is the one who found him and brought him to that perfect position that he's in. He tells her that's the work of an idol, and indeed, she is a good idol. She sighs. He asks why she had a breath like that, and she says it's for good. She's glad to hear someone call her a good idol, as she no longer believes in herself as an idol at all. He knows that she has been behaving strangely for a while. She had canceled all her contracts and magazine show, and he wonders why. She says that her real name is Belle Haggins, and she works with her boyfriend, Donna who owns a restaurant. She sings there, and back then she didn't even care if the guests were listening to her songs. In fact, they aren't listening to her songs, but she keeps singing for her personal gratification. One day after she finishes her presentation and steps down from the stage, she sees a man who tells her she is singing well, but next time she should ensure she faces the guests while singing. He tells her he is Joseph Coleman, the executive producer of Jewelry Production. He asks her if she wants to be an idol, and before she even processes her thoughts and answers him, Donna comes out, reminding her he wants her to report all the weird customers, and Joseph looks weird. Donna approaches Joseph, who introduces himself again and asks if Belle wants to become an idol. 
Donna asks how much they will pay, but Joseph tells him the idle world is where a person can get anything she wants. Joseph gives Belle a ticket to one of his shows before talking with Donna, who claims to be Belle's manager. Eventually, Belle attends the show. Before the show starts, she sits beside two girls who are also naive about the idol world. Immediately, the idols step on stage. The noise, the shouting, and the happiness on the faces of the viewers tell Belle all she needs to know about the idol world. At that point, greed takes the best hold of her. All she wants at that point is to be in their situation, that fame and joy. She wants it all for herself. After the show, she goes to meet Joseph and finds out the other girls are also there for the same purpose as her. They start training for their purpose, and they are all given names of jewelry. That's topaz, amber, and agate. While her fame skyrockets, she gets divided from Donna. They no longer relate on the same level. And one day, Donna asks if she can lend him some money. It's not like the request shocked her. She hadn't been expecting it. She asks him if the bar is doing badly, but he says no and he needs some cash. She gives it to him. Another time, as she enters the bar, he tells her he needs more money. She gets concerned, asking him what he's doing, but he claims that it will be the last time, and that he has met a Tigerian who has offered to help him. She wonders if he's gambling with the Tigerian, but gives him the money regardless. She's disturbed about what's happening, and she goes outside to cry. Outside the bar, she sees a stray dog. She tries to draw the dog nearer, but rain starts. As she looks at the cloud, she says that she knows she has all the money to help Donna, but she's worried that he will use all of it to gamble. She says that's not the wish Donna had for her life before they came together, and she remembers a time when he was setting up his new restaurant, when he told her he would make the restaurant very big and leave a big table for her in the middle where she will sing for everyone to hear. In that state, she was in that day. She goes into the restaurant back to take a drink and right there she overhears Nick's girlfriend, Claudine, telling him he doesn't deserve to be her boyfriend if he's no longer working for the Minister of War. So she's breaking up with him. Agate hears as Nick screams her name and begs her to stay, but she refuses and walks away. It's a rainy day and Nick walks around in the rain. She watches him with her umbrella as he walks away in the rain without an umbrella. He doesn't even know that rain is falling. He's shocked and unsure of what he wants to do next. And she has been in that situation too. She follows him as he finds a spot to sit in the rain. There, she brings him an umbrella and an invitation to her concert. She returns to the restaurant and she meets Donna, who tells her he wants her to give her some more money to bet. He claims it's to save his restaurant and tells her she will follow him to the casino house, where she will watch as he wins the games and brings back all the money they have lost. According to her, that statement seems like a breakup statement because that's the highlight of it all. She couldn't get a word out of her mouth at all as she kept looking at him. She agrees to follow him there and they arrive at the casino together. As they get to the casino, she watches as he wins against almost all the people at his table. At that point, when it seems like he's about to completely win, she sees a goddess. According to her, it isn't just a goddess but the god of all gamblers. The lady turns out to be Tiana. She claims Tiana looks at her as if she has an initial issue with her. And after Tiana defeats the table she's in, Tiana comes to her table, according to her. It seems like Tiana has come to that table to execute revenge on her because of what she has done. And when Tiana sits to play, she wins all of the money Donna has brought to the casino. And after beating him, she goes ahead to defeat Leon. Right in front of her, she sees Tiana suddenly disappear and change into a tundra. And after she changes and disappears, a gate sees a card in front of her. She picks the card up and sees it's a queen card. She takes the card away from her face and sees Tiana again. As a result, she idolizes Tiana. She calls her the beautiful paladin who had come to save her from the situation she was in. She returns to her office and meets her producer, Joseph. Donna has acquired several debts that he is now being chased and beaten for. Joseph meets Donna with a gate. He tells Donna he has paid all the debts and is now free. He can sleep without thinking about debts, but the condition at which he pays those debts is that Donna must not meet with their idol a gate again. Even if he sees her by the roadside, he must walk away as if he doesn't know her at all. That condition doesn't go well with Donna, who tries to protest. But Agate tells him she doesn't think he sees her for who she is. 
She admits that he isn't like that before, but says recently he has only seen the money behind her. She officially breaks up with him, but on his way of leaving the office, she calls him back and gives him the card that she had taken from the casino. She sees him several months later, sweeping at a compound, but they both walk past each other as if they do not know each other. A gate returns with a comeback solo concert after her break. She tells everyone about the beautiful paladin she had met in the casino and says that's her idol. She claims she wants to be like those bards who travel around. Look at what people are going through and sing about it. And then she makes her presentation. Nick is by the garden after his usual training and he's taking a drink. He hears a gate's voice again. Although she tries to deceive him that he hears voices from his mind. He asks her what's wrong with her telling her she seems bothered the last time they met. She tells him she isn't bothered, but like every human, she has worries, and those worries are what makes her human. She claims that after defeating a worry, another will come, and defeating each of it is a sign of leveling up. Kazuna reads an adventure magazine that speaks about a mysterious man called the Stepping Man who walks around the city and kidnaps young children. He can't be seen and he jumps from roof to roof with no one seeing him. She's excited by that news and she insists that the stepping man is no one else but a hero and she thinks his ability to kidnap young girls and jump around without being caught at all is actually beautiful. Thinking about her opinion of what is beautiful, one of her colleagues tells her she has a very weird idea of what beauty means. And I guess she's right. Kizuna refuses to accept what she has said. And she says she wishes to meet his mysterious stepping man, and she wants to get closer to him. Looking at her naiveness causes Nick to interfere. He tells her the idea of a stepping man is nothing but a false statement without any proof of it, and she should stop believing anything she finds in crappy magazines. She refuses what she has said, and she goes closer to him, showing him the magazine and telling him that there are people who have seen the stepping man, and there is proof of his existence. Nick insists that it doesn't exist, and as they talk more about it, another young lady who is walking beside the road overhears their conversation. Since she is also interested in conversations about this strange stepping man, she peeps through the window and tries to talk with them. She introduces herself as Olivia Taylor, and she is an adventurer as well as a writer for Lemuria Monthly Magazine, the same magazine Kizuna is holding in her hand happily. Kizuna jumps to meet her. She claims she is glad to meet her and that she has been an avid reader of her magazine. That sounds like a shock to all of her colleagues, especially Nick, who couldn't hide his shock and asks her when she had become obsessed with Lemuria magazine, reminding her that she had just got to know the magazine a few weeks ago and she hasn't even read a lot of it. She counters Nick immediately. She tells Nick that even if a person wants to tell her about love, it shouldn't be an idol otaku who is obsessed with an idol. She insists that time doesn't have anything to do with love, and if she claims she loves the magazine, then she does. Well, she's free to do her. Tiana looks at Olivia and remembers she claims she is a writer and an adventurer. She asks Olivia if she's really an adventurer, and Olivia enters the room and tries to show how nimble she is by jumping around, but she almost falls. She tells them she records about everything that happens in the city, so if they see any strange thing, they can do well to contact her. Kizuna's obsession with the stepping man was further fueled by Olivia. Later that night, Kizuna follows Nick to watch an idol festival while Zem goes to drink as usual. On his way home, he walks behind a little girl, and he looks at her as she walks away. Suddenly, he sees an invisible hand drag her from inside a corner, and when he realizes she's no longer on the road, he rightly assumes that she has been kidnapped. And he runs there. After the concert, Nick asks Kizuna if she liked the concert. And Kizuna admits it's not as bad as she had assumed it would be. And Agate is a pure person, and she could feel the purity in her heart. She says if in another world, Agate could pass as a shaman. Suddenly, she gets a signal that Zem is in trouble, and she informs Nick. They find the location and run there. When they get there, contrary to everyone's belief, Kizuna can see the stepping man. She immediately figures it's the stepping man and she screams that she will kill him. The stepping man is shocked that she can see him and he even confirms it when he sees her attack him. He immediately jumps up while Kizuna uses her parallel skills and divides into several parallel bodies to attack the stepping man. 
Before running off, the stepping man attacks her back, but it's a fake body. She's disappointed that the hero she has wanted to meet for a while is nothing else but a coward who can't even wait to fight. However, even Nick, who has believed the stepping man doesn't exist, the circumstances around them that night made him believe. Zem takes the younger girl who has been injured to Red's inn and asks Red to take care of her. As Red does so, he bombards the girl with several questions asking her how she got herself into that situation. The little girl introduces herself as Reyna. She says her mother has always thought the stepping man exists and that's the only explanation for how all the young children in the city keep disappearing. So she took it upon herself to find the stepping man and defeat it since no one believed her. But now her mother had disappeared and she's nowhere to be found. Zem tells her they believe her and they saw the stepping man themselves so there's no reason why they shouldn't believe. He tells her he will defeat the stepping man and probably find her mother so she should rest assured. Reyna is encouraged by Zem's strength. She tells him that she loved how he ran to save her despite being the only one, and she runs towards him, telling him she wants to be a student. Nick stops her on the way immediately. He tells her that 10 years old is too young to be Zem's student, and Zem says she has to be 15 years. She wonders how she will train until she is 15 years, and he advises that she stays with Red first. She attempts to run to him again to hug him, but Red and Nick stop her. Zem tells her that until she is 15, she can't come closer to him, and she accepts. The following day, the survivors decide to find the stepping man and kill him. They know they need more information about the stepping man, and they figure there is a bounty on him. So they walk to the bounty guild despite knowing the guild is unwelcoming, so they can get the information they need and get to the action. Immediately, they enter the guild. They meet several adventurers who don't welcome them. And they also meet the attendant and ask her that they need information about the stepping man. She claims the information is too valuable for her to give to unknown adventurers, but they look at her and show her they are the survivor's group. She shows them some information, telling them she can't give them the information about the stepping man unless they help her with a bounty. They accept, and she tells them to find a man named Hale Hardy, and there's a bounty of 300,000 Dina on him. She tells them since they are the survivors who had killed the Iron Tiger, she is sure they can pull the fight up. However, she shouts when saying this, and this calls the attention of the other adventurers and bounty hunters towards them. One of the bounty hunters confronts telling them they should leave that mission, and they should concentrate on the goblins that they specialize in killing. His colleagues beg the survivors not to get angry, and that is just a mere puff. But the man insists he knows what he is saying, and he offers to place a bet on who will win the fight between the survivors and Hale, before he can even mention the money he wants to bet with. Tiana brings out a bag containing 50,000 Dina, betting on the fact that herself and her colleagues will bring Hale to the guild, and asks the man to counter bet. The man says he will bet with all his life savings, and other people drop the amount they can drop. Tiana asks them to gather it until she returns. According to the guild report, Hale lives at the slum called Garbage Collection. They get there, and they meet with the security. They ask him if there is any new information that they can get about the slum, and he tells them one of their old whore died last week. And another member, Greg, his dog, gave birth to puppies. That's not the information they see. So the guard informs them that no one has been caught in the slum in about three months, and if they die inside, they should die silently. He also warns them that they should ensure that they do not interrupt a man named Nalgava during his duty. And they couldn't expect such an irritating place. They meet some men who ask for a toll gate fee, but they defeat them and ask where Hale is. The men tell them that Hale is in the bedroom. He describes where the bedroom is and begs them for a fee for the information he has given them. As Zem walks past him, he tells him that he will soon die and that he is taking some substances that is killing him. The man says he's unable to sleep. So Zem gives him a drug, telling him that should be the fee for his information. He tells them Hale is also very fast and they should be careful. They get to the bedroom and they meet Hale. They tell him there is a bounty on him and before he runs, they capture him. As they're about to take him out, they meet Nalgalava, a former priest who tells them Hale is his patient and they can't take Hale away. They try to explain to him that there's a bounty on Hale and he is a criminal who has done everything except murder. 
Nalgava says he can heal any illness, but he can't cure sins, so they should take Hale. He tells them Hale has a yellow demon disease, and he is treating him for it. At that point, Zem asks Nalgava why he's at the slum, and if he is good enough to know about yellow demon disease. And Nalgava throws the same question at him. Before leaving, Kizuna asks Nalgava if he knows about the stepping man. He says no, but they see how Hale reacts. They ask if Hale knows, and he says he has heard rumors about a man who shares sweets with children. They take Hale to the guild, and Tiana asks the bounty hunters for their betting money. She collects 800,000 dina from them, and gives it to the attendant asking her to sell free alcohol to everyone that night. The following day, they return for information about the bounty man. The attendant tells them she doesn't know the reason why they are interested in a fallacy called the stepping man, and says she would prefer that they take better jobs that pay bounties. All the information she has is useless, as just a case of missing identities. She tells them she doesn't know much about kids, and that if they want to know more, they should ask the lady who shares sweets with kids. And she's sitting by the other side. When they look in that direction, they see that it is Olivia. Nick asks Kizuna if she can remember anything she saw in the Stepping Man that night they fought. And Kizuna says it seems like the Stepping Man had chains on his legs. Curran remembers she was the one who held Olivia from falling that day they met. And she says Olivia seems heavy. Nick asks Tiana and Curran to guide the door. And he goes to confront Olivia. He asks her about her day's schedule, asking her what she was doing two nights before. She gives several excuses. And when he asks her if she is the stepping man, she suddenly kicks the table up and jumps out through the house's roof. Zem remembers the dream he dreamt about frequently. In that dream, he would see himself in prison, lying on the floor and screaming that they should spare him and shouldn't kill him. He would continue like that as he would see a man poking him with sticks and telling him to stop. After several minutes of screaming and shouting, he will wake up on his bed with rays of light around him without knowing of if he's still dreaming or he's in reality. And that's the way he has been feeling due to the trauma of his past. That day, the survivors sit at Red's Inn. They all talk about what they have seen, and they are all angry that Olivia is the stepping man. Kuran says she has never seen a person that is that fast before, and even Kizuna admits that that is how fast the stepping man she had fought was. So why does Olivia give children candy and kidnap them at night? Why is she writing about herself when she isn't obsessed? Why is she disguising herself as an adventurer and calling attention to herself when she is indeed the stepping man? All these questions beg for answers, are shared in the mind of the survivors as they think of the next step of action. And how they can defeat Olivia, the first thing they all can't deny is that she is fast, and her speed will always work to their disadvantage. As they discuss this, Red comes to tell them that a pretty lady wants to see them, although she claims that the lady isn't as pretty as her. They ask Red to bring the lady inside, and when she enters, she turns out to be Reyna's mother. While Reyna runs to her mother, Nick calls the lady Ada. Ada wonders if she is now that popular that everyone around knows her, and the other members of the group ask Nick how she got to know Ada. Nick explains that the lady is the swashbuckler legendary, a rank party grand chef, the legendary Ada, the sommelier. The others are impressed to hear that, and they ask her if she is indeed went adventuring with great teams like Fiefs, the great adventurer. She tells them she was indeed colleagues with adventure of the Platinum Peach Fiefs, the solo eater. She says she heard Fiefs is now an S-rank adventurer, and back then, when she and Fiefs were colleagues, they only went adventuring for the fun of it, and since they were in their young age. But now, she doesn't think she is in that shape any longer. She tells them that she heard that they saved her daughter from the stepping man, and she appreciates them for doing so, but she tells them she is done with anything about the stepping man. She tells them her daughter is done with it too. She says Reyna is too stubborn, and she doesn't know where Reyna has gotten her stubbornness from. Regardless, she won't allow Reyna to get involved in something like that. Reyna steps in. She tells her mother that Zem is now her master, and she wants to learn under Zem. She begs her mother to convince Zem to be her master, but Zem tells her it is not possible. Zem reveals to her that she is an enemy, not an enemy per se, but kids of her age scare him so much that he can't bear to stay around them. 
He said when he was a priest, a little girl of her age betrayed him and lied against him, so much so that he was imprisoned for an offense he didn't know about. He tells her that after his imprisonment, he feared girls of her age, and whenever he sees them, he freezes, so much so that he finds it difficult to talk. And it doesn't only concern talking, as he sometimes finds it difficult to even breathe. She eventually understands the reason he told her she can't come nearer to him until she's 15. She reminds him that he was the one who saved her. And if he hated young girls so much, why did he go out of his way to save her? He tells her he feels that's what every reasonable adult in that situation would do if they saw a young girl in trouble. And he just did that. However, after doing that, he views it as an improvement from how he was initially, and he thinks he's getting better. She tells him that she will come back when she is 15. Her mother, who doesn't understand what the conversation involves, asks her what she means and tells her she wouldn't allow her to marry an adventurer. Just as Zem is about to defend himself, Reyna comes to her mother's front and tells her she wants Zem to be her master. And if she wants to get married, she will think much about her decision and can't go for Zem. The other adventurers laugh at Zem, telling him how he has been rejected even before he makes his offer to marry her. He comments that by 15 years, she could actually be his type. After talking and joking around, they get back to business. They tell Ada all that they have found out and how the stepping man works. And Ada tells them she doesn't want to be involved in something like that. She doesn't want her daughter to be in danger, and she also doesn't want her daughter to be motherless, so that she will step back. She also advises the survivors to step back and take bounty cases that are worth it. She reminds them that they have seen the stepping man fight and run, and they are not a good fit for that fight. They will most likely lose their lives. Nick stands up to address Ada. He appreciates her for her concern over them, which made her give that advice but says she doesn't have a right to give them orders. As regards to what they should or not do, he tells her that they can't keep watching and allow the stepping man to kidnap children, but she reminds them that it's the work of a solar knight and not them. She says the solar knights are busy and they can't take charge of all the kidnapping cases, which is why she stepped in and created a narration that all the kidnapping cases were done by the stepping man. But it didn't work well, so she's withdrawing. Nick bows to her and asks her if she knows any way that they can fight the stepping man and win, because they won't leave the fight. She asks his colleagues if that's how their guild leader bows to just everyone, and they tell her that it's what makes him special. She eventually decides to help him, and she takes them to a bar. As they enter, she gives them a drink and asks them to drink it. Nick wonders what it is in the drink, and Curran smells it. She sees it's Glory Mushroom Stew, and she tells them it's a very strong stew that is sold for an expensive amount. They all drink it, and they ask Ada what the drink will do to them. She explains that the drink is an herb drink, and the mushroom in it works as latent magical potential, and it will bring out their potential. Since they're going to fight the stepping man who is fast and jumps a lot, they would need their male magic skill and their ability to dodge. Nick starts by saying he doesn't have magical skills, and the others give their excuses too. So she asks them if that's how their team gives up easily. She still decides to help them, so she brings out an igniter. She tells them that they will concentrate their energy on the igniter and call it to burn. She asks Curran to stay, but Curran has an issue with focusing, so she's unable to call the fire. She gives the igniter to Nick and asks him to call the fire. Nick attempts to do so, and after concentrating most of his powers, he eventually succeeds in calling a small fire. His colleagues are shocked because, out of them all, he's the only one who isn't that great at magic. He asks Ada if that tiny fire can actually work and destroy the greatest kidnapper in their world right now, and she tells him she just wanted to test him and knows his skills. And now she has found out he is one with the greatest skill for that task. She uses the igniter to call a greater fire. They begin to train, and she tells them that the stepping man uses two enhancement spells. The first one of the light body, and the second one is the heavy body. She asks Nick to climb on a rope and tie it in the air, and he should jump ten times on the rope. He successfully jumps the first, second, third, and even until he gets to the ninth jumping. Just as he's about to come down for the ninth one, he falls off. Ada looks at him disappointed, saying she thinks he is the one with the greatest potential. They target the time the stepping man kidnaps the last child, and they go to that same place and wait for him that night. 
A young girl is walking, and the stepping man jumps to kidnap her, but Kizuna jumps back and takes the girl from him. The stepping man falls. They approach him, telling him that if only they knew his manner of operation, they would defeat him immediately. Nick asks him if he is Olivia, but the stepping man doesn't answer and jumps off. The team comes together to discuss. The stepping man is using three magics together, attack magic, movement magic, and illusion magic. No mage can use the three magics together, and one of them has to be a magic artifact. Since they don't know about magic artifacts, they decide to find someone who does. Nick goes to prison to bribe a demon. He asks which artifact can be used for illusion magic and find out it is an illusion king jewel. He asks how he can remove the magic and tells him he has to mention the person's name. And if it's correct, you can get the magic to break. He figures the stepping man may not be Olivia because he mentioned Olivia the day before and the magic didn't break. The demon tells him that before he mentions the name, he has to be sure it is the person as he can't mention mindless names and his heart has to have clarity. He returns home to keep training with Eda. As he successfully uses light magic, his colleagues return to tell him that since the stepping man jumps roof to roof, they have restricted their search to areas where the roofs have been leaking, and their search leads them back to the slum. As they reach the slum, they meet the guard and ask him if there is any new updates. He tells them two of Greg's puppies have died, and a man came to bury a young girl where adults are being buried. As they are about to check the corpse of the girl, they figure someone is trailing them. After checking for a while, the person jumps at Nick and fights him. Nick uses light magic and the person screams that Nick is the stepping man. When Nick attempts to use parallel, the lady stops it. Nick figures he may be using illusion magic, so he calls out the name of Olivia. It turns out the lady is Olivia and she accuses Nick of being the stepping man. They realize they have both been mistaken and the team blames her for running off the last time. If she had spoken with them, the mistake wouldn't have occurred. However, since they have the same mission, they should go to check the corpse. When they see the corpse, it's perfect. Olivia says there is something strange about it. So she asks that they remove the body, and they see a price of the King Illusion Jewel. After breaking it, they see the face change, and when Zem checks the eyes, he sees the girl was treated for yellow demon sickness. They return to Red's Inn, and they find out the girl is Martha. Her parents have been looking for her, but they couldn't report her because she runs away from home frequently, so they don't know she's dead. They decide to take the corpse to her parents and get revenge for her death. Zem immediately figures that the only person in the slum who can treat the yellow demon sickness or even attempt to treat it, thereby making Martha have the sign of yellow demon treatment, is Nagalva. They spend their time checking out and finding out Nagalva's mode of operation, and their main intention is to bring him to justice. He works at a particular time of the night, and he jumps from roof to roof, ensuring that he isn't seen. That fateful night, Nick goes to approach him. Nick fights him and tells him he has figured out the way he fights and what he does. However, Nick insists that he doesn't know the rationale behind what Nalgava does, and if Nalgava is just behaving that way to dare the authority and to make them prove that they can catch him. Because why on earth will he keep doing the same thing? every time despite knowing how he can get caught. Nalgava looks at him, although still under his illusion, and tells him he has learned the light magic and is now good at it. Although he isn't as good as he is, Nick asks Nalgava if he isn't suspecting him to be the stepping man, since everyone thinks the stepping man is the only one using the light magic. Nalgava says he doesn't. He tells Nick that Nick doesn't know what he's getting involved in and how it will affect him, and he concludes that Nick is naive and can't guess what's happening. He says Nick has found out everything about him except one thing, which is the most important, but Nick laughs at him and tells him he has found it out. He calls out his name, Nalgava, with a lot of surety, and the King Illusion Jewel with Nalgava has been using to cover himself falls off. With his real face exposed, he asks Nick what Nick wants. Nick insists he still doesn't know what Nalgava intends to do by kidnapping and killing young girls, and that's what he wants to know, but Nalgava refuses to give him the answer and asks to fight with him. He tells Nalgava that their priest, Zem, has taught him all he needs to know about that fight. He keeps hitting Nalgava, although Nalgava dodges all his attacks. Nalgava calls him a fool, asking him if he doesn't know that he can predict all of his attacks. He can also predict Nalgava's attacks, so he jumps up and concentrates all of his weight on one leg, 
and uses the leg to kick Nalgava. Again, Nalgava calls him a fool. He asks him if he doesn't know that concentrating his weight will make the roof weak, and he replies that's his intention. The roof breaks, and they fall into a building. He tells Nalgava that his plans were smooth and it was coordinated. They know where he passes, so it's easier for them to lay a trap for him. Inside the room they have fallen, the other members of the Survivor Guild are there, and Kizuna also blocks the broken roof. Zem comes out, and he says he's disappointed in Nalgava, as when he met Nalgava doing his work in the slum. He had assumed Nalgava was a great priest who had the intention of helping the people, but now he's disappointed that he is wrong. He asks Nalgava why he engaged in that miserable thing, and Nalgava explains that he lost his daughter to yellow demon sickness. Zem says he knows, and he found that out during his research about him. In that city, people know the yellow sickness disease as a sexually transmitted disease, and they assume anyone who gets it is unholy. However, Nalgava's daughter was trying to help a sick man, and she got in contact with his blood, thereby getting the disease. The people refuse to believe that, and they mock her. They call her several names, and these names get Nalgava uncomfortable. Despite all his efforts to save his dear child, who didn't know about the disease, the girl died. He gets frustrated, and he decides that if he finds the cure to that disease, he'll be able to forgive himself for his daughter's death. So he decided to create the disease in itself, spread it across to the girls he had kidnapped so he would use them as lab tests to find the solution to the disease. Zem says he figured it out easily because if the yellow demon disease is a pandemic, it could have spread at the slum first. Instead, it didn't spread in the slum, which makes him conclude the disease is human-made. Nalgava refuses to accept fault for what he has done. He claims he needed to find a cure so he can be fine, and doesn't care about how many lives would have been lost in the search for a cure. Zem gets more disappointed. He says he knows they are former priests, but he also knows they once believed in the power and knowledge of the priesthood, and they shouldn't have done that. Nalgava corrects him, telling him he was never a good priest compared to Zem. He says that when he was traveling, he met a prominent priest, and he followed the man and convinced him to make him a priest, who is why he has the title. He didn't live his priesthood days in holy ways, and he doesn't care that Zem is disappointed in him. He tells Zem that he isn't a pretender, just that everyone has some shades of their lives that are hidden. It's like the card, and everyone has several cards on their hands and each of them comes with its responsibility. He says Zem will also have his other cards, and he won't deny these other cards. Zem explains that he doesn't have to think the kids he has been killing are from nowhere. He said when he took Martha to her parents, he could see how they were crying for their daughter, and Martha isn't just a nameless child, so Nalgava is wrong whether he accepts it or not. Nalgava laughs at them and tells them it's not over. Suddenly, Kizuna uses telepathy to tell them she feels someone is around. When they are about to check, someone attacks and kills Nalgava immediately. The person breaks the door saying the priest days are over. The man enters with an ancient, wears the white mask. And when Olivia joins the fight, she calls him the white mask. After Nalgava falls, he asks the white mask if the white mask has come to kill him as revenge for how he had used the king illusion jewel. He says that's just one of the reasons, and the second reason is that Nalgala has allowed his secret to be exposed to little children, who don't deserve to know what they know at that moment. Zem doesn't want Nalgava to die despite the wrongs Nalgava has done, so he tries to use his quick heal to heal Nalgava, but White Mask hits him and throws him off. He tells him to save his magic as he will need it for better things later. He tells him that he will also die soon. So also his colleagues. It's best they keep their magic to heal each other. He says they have gotten to know what they shouldn't know, and their reward for that is death, so they should be prepared. Upon hearing this, the other members of the team call out to their magical power, and the fire dragon fan sets out, and the icicle dance. Unfortunately, the white mask defeats them and all without stress. Instead of going to fight or healing his colleagues, Zem keeps trying to heal Nalgava, this makes Nalgava tell him that he will be the end of his colleagues. He is the only one standing among them, and instead of him to keep his magic to help them, he wants to use it as a useless attempt. He tells him he may think what he is doing is kindness, but what he's doing is far from kindness. Instead, it is self-centeredness, 
and he will use his selfishness to kill his colleagues. At that point, Nick also reaches out to Zen using telepathy. He tells him he is the only one standing among them and that he should use Union to save them. Zem doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know if he can use Union. He thinks of what to do as Nick reaches out again and says Olivia is coming. And she will use her stupid words to distract White Mask for a while, giving Zem the opportunity to use Union. As planned, Olivia arrives. She comes in her usual pettiness. And she hits the White Mask quickly. And she calls the White Mask by its name, explaining all his powers as the residual of the magical property of the gods. She knows so much that the White Mask tells her knowledge kills, but she says she's too pretty to die. She eventually succeeds in stabbing the White Mask's eyes, although she knows it's an ancient magical mask and her stab won't work. Eventually, Zem uses Union and he unites with Nick to create an ancient magical blade. When the White Mask sees it, he's shocked because the blade has been long lost and it isn't in the ancient world. He decides to concentrate on the Union, and to do so, he imprisons Olivia in a great red spot which he created. With just a few minutes in that spot, Olivia will die. Nick feels the need to rescue Olivia first, but knows if he goes there, he will die too. He knows the White Wolf skills are crazy, and he has to overrun him with speed, and he makes an attempt to do so. He runs around changing colors, and the White Wolf is unable to defeat him. On the other hand, Olivia is almost dying. She gives up, but suddenly sees the red spot as getting weaker. She figures that the White Wolf has stopped concentrating there, so she breaks it and attacks the White Mask. After her attacks, the White Mask figures out the way Nick is running and attacks Nick, saying he has caught him. But Nick tells him he's caught in their trap. They hit him with the sword, but he doesn't die. He admits defeat, saying no one has ever defeated him in that way. He throws a bomb and escapes. Later, the team wakes up after several hours of collapsing. They stand up and see Nalgava is almost dead. They try to rescue him, but Olivia reminds them that he has been there for a long time and that even if he is rescued, he will die. He tells them he's dying, and the building will soon collapse, so they should leave him there. At that point, Zem realizes that he has the yellow demon sickness too. Since Nalgava doesn't want to be rescued, Zem decides to send him off. He does so, and they leave. After leaving the building, they are glad they have survived that encounter, but Olivia tells them it's not over. They turn to her, asking her if she knows more than they know. And she tells them the white mask is still out there, and if he indeed has magic, then they are still in trouble. They ask her who she is, and she asks Kizuna if she is the Sword of Bond, since Kizuna can use Union. Kizuna admits, and she eventually introduces herself. She says she is a writer, adventurer, stepping man, and the elemental class anti-demon god combat technician training program called the Sword of War. After defeating the Stepping Man, the members of the Survivor team sleep. They spend days in their bed without taking any more adventure or anything to make their day better. They spend their time in bed, and it gives them time to think. The time to think about things they shouldn't be thinking about in the first place, and time to think about things they haven't been thinking about. One thing to know about humans is that humans think. They think about all that they can go through per day, and how to manage the new life they have found themselves living. After spending some days in bed, Nick stands up and goes to his shelf. He sees his first sword, and he holds it with his hands. He thinks about humanity and wonders if he needs to do anything to save humanity in the first place. He remembers the first time he got to the labyrinth that day. He was in the carriage with his father, driving his mother beside him. He goes to ask his father which city they are going to know, and his father tells him they are going to Labyrinth City despite the fact that they have left there since a long time ago. He asks him if he remembers his uncle, Argus, and he recalls that he remembers how Argus used to tap his head. Happily, he asks his father if Argus will tap his head again, but before he can get a response, a bandit stops the carriage and attacks them. He attempts to go out and check, but his mother puts him in a remote part of the carriage, telling him never to come out and telling him they love him so much. He stays there as he hears his parents fight, and he also hears them telling Argus that he saved them. It turns out his parents died. The bandit enters the carriage to take the things that can be stolen. And after he takes some money, he sees the drum Nick's mother has kept him in. He opens it to check, but Nick isn't there. 
Nick sneaks out of the carriage through the door, hoping he's safe, but he sees a man in front of him. The bandit also comes out and attempts to kill him, but the man kills the bandit. The man apologizes to him, telling him he is Argus. Argus works at the Ministry of War, and he teaches him how to fight. After learning for a while, he becomes an adventurer too, and goes on his first mission to the Sticky Aqueducts, where Argus tells him that that's where adventurers start their missions. He tells him that adventurers trust each other, and he must learn to trust, but he must also be careful. He then tells Argus that he will be careful, but at that moment, he falls. When he's about to go for the first mission, Argus buys him the sword. He goes there and he encounters a monster who breaks the sword immediately. He doesn't know the reason he decided to be an adventurer, if it's because he wants to get stronger, or because he wants to be strong enough to have defended his parents that day. Eventually, he is sent out of the ministry. Their mind of Nick that morning is filled with several questions of what-if questions to which he has no answer. When he wakes, he hears the humming of a gate's song. The song is familiar because he knows it too, so he checks through his window and sees a gate there. She comments that the rain doesn't want to stop, although she doesn't know that's his house. He brings the umbrella she had offered him the first day they met and tells him he will use that opportunity to return her umbrella. She recognizes him immediately and wants to call his name, but doesn't know his name. She asks for his hand, but he says he is Mr. Stray Dog. She tells him about how she gave him that umbrella because she thought he didn't have a home. And now she's glad that he now has a home. He tells her he's a stray dog who loves an idol, and she introduces herself as a gate, the idol. Zem now works at the slum. He helps a man treat his broken ribs. And the man asks him if he is the one that killed... Nalgava. He admits to killing Nalgava, and the man jumps up, saying he placed a bet that Zem had killed Nalgava, so he could take Nalgava's work at the slum. Zem advises him not to bet with the three broken ribs, and he says if he had lost the bet, he would have lost three more ribs. After the man leaves, the guard comes for treatment. Zem says that despite the evil things Nalgava had done, he can't find himself hating him, and he's doing that job to remember him so he won't think or because he loves it. He concludes that he is doing the job for two reasons, and the two reasons are, one, the guard appreciates him as he leaves his clinic. Tiana wakes up thinking about her life. She knows she doesn't hate the life she lives at the moment, but it doesn't mean she loves it. She takes herself to bet every day because she wants to remember the life she had lived before and how that life had been. She goes to watch a horse race and places a bet, although she knows you should only place a bet where you are confident you will win. But she's a lucky girl. She wins that bet, and she says that she has been winning and losing, so she hasn't gained any money or lost any. Above all, she has everything she ever needs. She goes to eat, and when she tastes the soup, she assumes that Curran will like it. After several days, they meet together at their meeting point. Curran arrives last, and when she enters... She asks them all how they're doing. She sees that they will look disturbed by several things, and she assumes that despite the good works they have been doing, they all have several inner battles that they are dealing with. Kizuna looks at Zem's leg, and she sees that his robe is dirty by the tip. She rightly assumes that Zem is still working at the slum. She asks him why he's still doing that work, and he reminds her that their number one rule as a survivor is that they must not interfere in another person's life or wish. She decides to accept what he wants, so she tells him that if he wants to keep working at that difficult place, he will need her protection, so he should see her as a guiding angel. He appreciates her for her kind gesture. They have another meeting, and Curran comes last again. Immediately she enters. She asks them how they're doing, and they tell her they're doing great. Kizuna sees the copy of Olivia's new edition of the Lemuria magazine on the table, and she screams because she's excited. The others wonder why Olivia is still keeping up with her stupid magazine, while Curran asks them if they have eaten. Zem says he had eaten at Red's place, while Tiana says she has smoked for the day. So Curran tells them she wants to go find something to eat. As she walks away, she wonders if the others have forgotten the worries in their heart that brought them together. She knows they might have forgotten, but she can't forget. She can't forget her former team headed by Kalios, which she trusted and believed they were friends until they betrayed her and stole her Dragon King jewel. 
She belongs to the Dragon Clan, and she is the daughter of their head, and she knows how much the Dragon King jewel means to her, and despite the happiness she's feeling at the moment, it can't make her forget how important what she has lost is to her, and she can't forget it. She says she's unable to move on, and she keeps thinking about it. At that point, she reaches the market, and she sees the same merchant who had tried to deceive her when she was arriving at the city, and she has scratched a pendant. The same merchant is trying to accuse a girl of the tiger clan that she has used her finger to scratch a pendant, and she must buy it. Curran goes to intervene, and she tells the man that she knows he's lying, and the man even recognizes her. Before she finishes, the younger tiger girl runs away. She turns to her back and she meets her teammates. She asks them what they are doing there. They tell her they're going to the Summer Sleep Festival. She asks them what the festival is all about. And they explain it's a festival where the monsters are quiet and they celebrate. She asks if there will be food. And when they reply in the affirmative, she decides to follow them. As they walk away, she thinks about her mission as a member of the Dragonian, which is to find the hero and help the hero save the world. She knows she's the daughter of the Tsubaki clan leader, and she has forgotten her duty because she can't find the jewel. Suddenly, they all hear a noise behind them. They turn to their back, and it turns out to be Olivia, who is holding a paper and throwing it around as the latest edition of her magazine. She throws one of it at Tiana. She tells them she has news for them, and if they aren't excited about the news, she wouldn't share it with them. The others are nonchalant about what she's saying. But Kizuna jumps with her and asks her to share the news. Tiana reads in the paper that she is reading that the legendary dark demon god is on the verge of reviving. They do not believe her because they know what she does over time is to create a rumor and spread it around. But this time around, she tries to convince them that she is sure. She claims she has her witness and she's sure the demon god is about to awake. She tells them that the white mask is also involved and Nick asks her to share what she knows. But she says she doesn't know much. She tells them she knows a store in the market where they sell artifacts like the Illusion King Jewel. So they ask her to take them there, but she doesn't even know the place. They decide she's not serious, but Curran asks if she knows if they are selling the Dragon King Jewel there. She tells her friends that she knows she is happy with them, but she can't forget about her past, and she wants the Dragon King Jewel back. So Tiana tells her that if she can't forget about it, then she should chase it. Olivia adds that if there is a chain of bad men, then there will also be another bad man supporting them. And all they have to do is to find the chain until they get to the worst man. So Curran should make her work on a task and they will execute it the same way they did about the stepping man. The others agree to join them and they give Nick no other choice but to agree too. After they make the decision, they see the fireworks and the series ends.